Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our afternoon session of our second Climate Mastermind event. For those of you that missed this morning's session, my name is Heather McDougall. I'm CEO of the McDougall Program and John McDougall's daughter. I will be your moderator for this afternoon's session. We are so excited to continue this very important discussion about what needs to be done to save our planet. As I said this morning, the more I learn about this topic, the more I realize it is so important to get this message out to the world. And I feel even stronger about that after this morning session. So just a little housekeeping before we get started. This afternoon session will be just like this morning. We'll have um, three short presentations and immediately following we'll have a Q&A with our panelists. Please note this entire event is being recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel. So please share this important message with your family and friends. We wanna hear from you this afternoon, so please type your questions in the Q&A or the chat and we'll try to get to all of them. So let's get started. Dr. McDougall, Dad. Oh, okay, thank you very much, Heather. Uh, we had a great time this morning. Of course, you and I have been having a great time together running the McDougall program, which is our 12-day live-in program, which used to be in Santa Rosa, California. Now it's all over the world. So it's been really wonderful for our relationship, Heather, and I'm glad we can extend this to, uh, to change in the world and hopefully introduce into the world is something that's really lacking. And that is the understanding of the importance of uh, diet in solving the climate crisis. And a lot of people, no, let's just go, let's go so far as to say almost nobody is willing to step up to the plate and discuss the importance of changing food, uh, eliminating as much as we can the livestock industry as far as its contribution to uh, planetary destruction. We have a lot, of, a lot of leaders up there, including our new administration that's talking about fossil fuels. That's angering a lot of people. Uh, of course, the, of course, people that work for the uh, fossil fuel industry are very upset and people who really like their gasoline powered cars, et cetera. But uh, nobody seems to, I don't know, maybe, maybe, maybe it's, it, it's difficult to talk about your dinner plate. For some reason or another, it's been that way in my whole career when it comes to the practice of diet therapy, which I've been doing for 44 years where I help people who have uh, dietarily caused diseases, diseases from eating the rich Western diet. I help them get over their high blood pressure, diabetes, coronary artery disease, bowel problems, uh, arthritis problems, and so on. I mean, this is a cure that I've had a chance to help people with over 44 years of practice. And of course we publish our scientific work on this, but they've been resistant. And we have a, a dietitian to help us understand why on an individual level, people have been resistant uh, to making this kind of dietary change. And it seems to be, maybe we can get some answers. Why this type of resistance to talk about food carries over into saving our planet. You know, we have Al Gore, who uh, is the leader of this, uh, The Inconvenient Truth. He started all this for me. He doesn't talk about food, even though, by the way, I think Al Gore has changed his diet. I know Al Gore has changed his diet. And I think we had an influence on him. You look at him these days, and he's quite a bit thinner than he was when, when he uh, made his pronouncement of the inconvenient truth in 2006. So he's progressed, but still he's not talking about it in the sequelae of an inconvenient truth in 2017. Again, total absence of the discussion of food, agriculture, of the meat industry, uh, of the fish, et cetera. And uh, even our... Uh, our most uh, vocal and important spokesperson out there, Greta Thunberg. You know, she, she tells us that she's vegan and her, her dad is vegan and her mom's almost vegan. But as far as uh, putting a big emphasis on, hey folks, especially the kids, you know, the kids are open to this. Why isn't she talking about the food? Something that people can, can change themselves overnight costs nothing and the improvements are phenomenal. Uh, they feel better, they look better, they get rid of their diseases, they get off of almost all their medications. You know, life is better. They're, they're better athletes. You know, the winners of uh, triathlons and marathons are people who live on a, the kind of diet that we recommend. So I just can't see any downside. Maybe our guests this afternoon will be able to help us understand where in the world am I missing my ability to convey a simple message to people. And is it ever going to happen? And how do we do it? And I know the urgency is there. I'm sure everybody understands the urgency. 
But our guests have a message of hope, just like this morning. There are things we can do. And, and just like you said, changing your diet, anybody can do, and it can happen overnight, and it costs nothing. Yeah. So, and what they don't, yeah, they just don't realize what they're giving up there, you know. Oh, I, I do. I mean, as, as we discussed this morning uh, with one of our guests, uh, I used to eat the rich, rich Western diet with enthusiasm. I didn't think I could live without meat. And that's where most of us come from is that particular, you know, understanding about what good nutrition is. But I've learned. I've learned over the years. In fact, I changed my diet in 1977. I followed a vegan diet pretty much since 1977. I can't say without exception, maybe for the last 25 years without exception. But I, I, the food I eat is so, so much more enjoyable than what I ever used to eat. You know, the, the food I used to eat, particularly if we're going to focus on the animal products, is very bland tasting or even disgusting tasting. I, I talk to our patients, then I'll uh, challenge them with the idea that they should, uh, they don't naturally enjoy eating chicken. Even if you take the feathers off the bird, they don't like it. Even if you boil it, they don't like it. You can't even get them to eat boiled chicken. they got to cover it up with uh, some kind of a barbecue sauce or sweet and sour sauce or lots of salt for sure. Same thing with beef. Boiled beef is just disgusting. And so they take disgusting food and uh, make it palatable by, by covering up with sauces. Why don't they just get rid of the disgusting food? You know, instead, have a starch-based diet, which is what I recommend. And uh, we're unique in uh, telling people to eat a starch-based diet. I realize that, you know, that's uh, a word that has a lot of bad connotations thanks to the food industry. You know, starch is what you ought to be eating. Starch, of course, is rice, corn, potatoes, sweet potatoes, beans, peas, lentils, pastas, breads. These are the foods that people have traditionally eaten throughout all of known human history. The bulk of the diet of all successful populations of people throughout all of verifiable human history have been based on starch. And the exceptions have only been those people who have lived in the extremes of the environment, such as the Inuit Eskimo, or a couple of populations uh, along the Amazon, or a couple of populations in Africa. Otherwise, you, know, you talk about the Asians, they lived on rice. Up until recently, 1980, everything changed. You know, with CNN News and uh, the financial uh, the financial improvement that has occurred in very many parts of the world. Uh, people see the American diet and they want it. They want to be like Americans and they've changed their, their diet. And we see that. The World Health Organization came out 20 years ago and told us that diseases of overnutrition, obesity, heart disease, diabetes, arthritis, and so on, are much more common than diseases of undernutrition. And that's good that we've eliminated starvation and undernutrition in many parts of the world. But why replace it with diseases of overnutrition, which are very expensive? So um, and most of us are old enough to have witnessed the changes that have taken place over the last 40 years, or in my case, more than 70 years. And uh, the question is, can we go back to the traditional way of eating? I think we can. Uh, I know we have to. I know we will. Not not a can we can't, can we have to. We will go back to the traditional way of eating. And the reason is, is even if we don't do it under our own control, you know, by choosing to eat a healthy diet that's tasty and makes food abundant to everybody in the world, which we can do. Uh, nature, uh, evolution, or the kind, kind of uh, changes that are about to take place are going to make food more difficult to get. You're going to have to eat if there's any food for you available in times of terrible distress that are before us. Uh, you'll be lucky if you get some rice to eat. You'll be lucky if you have some potatoes to eat. Why not, why not do it now when we have so much control? You know, everybody's got a device. You know, they walk around with their iPhones. So we, unprecedented of the world with technology, unprecedented a chance to change so that we get ahead of this thing and we can give planet Earth a chance to, to allow us to continue to live on her. Because right now, you know, planet Earth says, I'm going on without you. And uh, uh, anyway, this this is exciting. So happy that we can get together again this afternoon. Welcome our guests. It's clear that what we're doing now is not sustainable. And I think what's so excellent is the diet that we've been teaching or you've been teaching for so many decades is the same diet that really is ultimately gonna save the planet, so. Yeah. It's the same diet that people who are worried about COVID-19 should be con concerned about too. I mean, everything's about COVID-19. 
every newscast, every newspaper headline, uh, you know, several times in every newspaper. They talk about COVID-19. That's all the world is thinking about. Well, that's a real advantage. And we're going to get into that with our guests. I'm sure each and every one of them will speak from their point of view as to why COVID-19 has made things better in terms of saving the planet. And when people realize from a medical doctor's point of view, that if you eat well, you're very unlikely to end up in the hospital. You're very unlikely to end up on a ventilator, very unlikely to die. The people who have comorbid or premorbid conditions, they call it, they should call it obesity and diabetes and uh, constipation. <laughs> people who have these problems, uh, every expert, CDC, uh, Anthony Fauci, uh, the, the British Medical Journal editor, everybody knows that, uh, <clears throat> that uh, people who have these pre-morbid, comorbid conditions are the ones that end up with a progression of very serious illnesses. And we hear from all these experts, this is a unanimous understanding among the scientists that if you eat well, you've got a tool that can help prevent you from ending up in that hospital on that ventilator or dying. So you got you know one tool, which is uh, public health measures, wearing a mask, washing your hands, social distancing, and that's something we promote greatly. But you have another tool, and that's the same tool that cures most people who have chronic diseases, and the same tool that's going to save our planet. Without introducing this tool, experts say these days is we can solve all the fossil fuel issues. We can we can make energy completely clean, and we're we're too late. But we throw in this card that nobody's talking about, and uh, we can win. We're gonna we're gonna keep our planet for the future, or keep our valued home. That's a good message. It's important. So shall we uh, shall we introduce uh, our first guest this this afternoon? Yeah, I'm excited. All right, Jeremy Lenton. He just wants to be called Jeremy. He's the author and founder of Leology Institute. You'll have to tell us a little bit more about that. But uh, his uh, message is one of uh, history, of how people can make important changes. And Well, I think we'll just get into the video and you'll help understand what he, where he comes from and what his contribution is. Okay, here we go. Hi, I'm Jeremy Lind, author of The Patterning Instinct and the upcoming book, The Web of Meaning. And I'm going to be taking you through today uh, some of the deeper implications of the choices each of us makes um, regarding whether it's diet, lifestyle, or our practices on shifting the direction of our global culture and even our civilization. When each of us makes a commitment to move toward a, a plant-based diet, we might have our own unique set of reasons, maybe some mixture of health-related reasons, environment and climate-related, and moral reasons arising from the horrendous animal cruelty that's so pervasive. Now, in themselves, each of these issues are crucially important, but I'm going to take you through today some highlights from my own work showing how they are related to a whole web of interconnected forces that together have the potential to transform our civilization this century onto a different trajectory, what some people refer to as the great transformation. So now I'm going to um, shift and share my screen for a slideshow. <clears throat> and um, let's begin here. Uh, <clears throat> what we are looking at and um, what I'm going to take you through, the title of the presentation is Plant-Based Diets as Part of the Great Transformation. And maybe begin um, with why we need that great transformation in the first place, something I'm sure a number of people watching are very familiar with, but just to get our basis of where we're starting from, let's take a look at our home, <clears throat> uh, the earth, the only place we know of in the universe where life exists and where <clears throat> a couple of hundred thousand years ago, human, the human modern species evolved and took a sort of commanding presence on this earth and 
Um, how are we managing it? Well, uh, of course, we know uh, that from a climate perspective, <clears throat> we're doing an absolute disastrous situation. Uh, we're headed towards a three to five degree Celsius rise this century and current policies in climate absolute catastrophic. And even a two degree rise would be a prescription for disaster according to climate experts. And even the radical changes we'd need to get to that one and a half degree Celsius is itself not a safe target because of the zone of cascading amplifying feedbacks. But here's the thing, even if we were somehow able to um, find some magic bullet that really solved the climate crisis rapidly enough, um, we've got to recognize that we are experience, experiencing vast ecological destruction across the board. And we're looking at we, a 68% decline in animal populations since 1970, all around the world. Um, the sixth great extinction of species. Um, there have been five other extinctions of species since life began on Earth. This one is human caused and we're initiating it right now. Um, this century, by the middle of this century, we'll probably be seeing the annihilation of coral reefs worldwide. And 95% of the Earth's land is um, forecast by the United Nations to be degraded by 2050. Of all statistics, this is the one that I think blows me away more than almost anything. By 2050, there will be more plastic at current rates in the ocean than fish. Now, as many people are well aware, <clears throat> what we're experiencing as a result of what's um, sometimes called the great acceleration, almost everything you look at that relates to human activity has been just exploding ever since the um, Second World War ending, the GDP, water use, um, consumption, production, just about everything. And if we look at the, what's forecast under our current world system, what we see is a continuation of this incredible growth. So global production today is at 92 trillion. And by <clears throat> conservative forecast, that's projected to triple by 2060. So all that destruction at the current rate of production now expected to triple. And that is largely because we are in the throes of this growth-based global economy <clears throat> that has as its overriding requirements to keep growing at all costs, to monetize everything as fast as possible in order to do this. And, by, and what that means is to turn humans into these kind of consumer zombies and to exploit every available resource on the earth as part of doing it. And that's um, both caused and is driven by this fact that 69 of the world's largest economies right now are not even countries, but are transnational corporations whose sole mission is to keep that growth happening as fast as possible to basically turn the whole earth into this consumer, uh, this place of consumption. So it's a system that isn't designed to look after the earth, but is designed to ultimately just mint billionaires. And it's one this led to the greatest inequality in history, where right now the wealthiest 26 billionaires own as much wealth as half the entire world's population. Which makes, of course, many of us have to ask, is our civilization at this rate headed for collapse? Or can we transform our society for a flourishing future? Now I'm gonna step back a little bit and take you through some work <clears throat> that I did um, on um, my earlier book, The Patterning Instinct, to look at how did we get to this place in the first place? Because it's only by really understanding that context of where we came from that we can really get a better sense of where we can head to. Well, <clears throat> what we saw, what I found is that actually there have been only a couple of great transitions in human history. One from hunter-gatherers to agriculture about 10,000 years ago. One from agriculture to the scientific revolution about 400 years ago. This century, we're almost certainly going through one of those great transitions uh, right now. Where is it going to go? That's the big question. So one of the things that I discovered in this book, The Patterning Instinct, and the, probably the biggest theme that came from it is this simple message that culture shapes values and values shape history. And by that same token, our values 
a what will shape the future. <clears throat> and when we look at those changes, those fundamental great transitions in human history, they all arose um, around fundamental transformations of values in the human experience. So I'll just take us really briefly through some of those historical patterns and um, beginning with the the value system of hunter-gatherers who saw nature <clears throat> based on this kind of root metaphor of uh, nature as being a giving parent. And the thing, the way that values work is that from a core root metaphor of nature, all kinds of implications and ramifications emerge. So when you see nature as a giving parent, it makes sense to see all living beings a family, that we all have an intimate relationship with spirits, that we can trust nature to meet our needs, that everything is connected and <clears throat> that the natural world, of course, has intrinsic value. Now that all changed about 10,000 years ago with the rise of agriculture, where a different kind of conception of nature arose, seeing it as a hierarchy of the gods. Now that began <clears throat> because of the fact that with agriculture came a separation that had never happened in the human in human history before. So in some senses, I see this kind of fence as iconic of this rise of agriculture, because we see um, that humans is now separate from nature <clears throat> and humans as separate from each other. So those who got lucky enough or worked hard enough to <clears throat> um, make more crops from their field, then kept other people out, leading to the rise in hierarchy where they might employ other people and the um, rise of, issue, of the sense of wealth leading to this conception of nature itself as being a hierarchy of the gods, similar to the kind of conception that people had of their own society. So from that new root metaphor of a hierarchy of gods came these new ideas <clears throat> about <clears throat> core values, seeing the intrinsic value of wealth, possessions and power, believing that you can't anymore trust the gods, you need to worship, um, then you need to sacrifice to them and a priesthood emerged to like intermediate between people and the gods. And above all the sense that you need to respect the hierarchy. And along with that, of course, came the rise of the patriarchy. Now, even though different agrarian civilizations look very different around the world, they all had the shared sense of core values um, <clears throat> around the world until the next big shift in the human experience that took place with the scientific revolution about 400 years ago, where a new root metaphor of nature um, arose, a sense of nature as being a machine or a resource to exploit. And with this new understanding of nature came the idea of, of the conquest of nature. If it was like a machine, you could figure out how it works. And then as in the words of this, of Francis, Francis Bacon, the great prophet of the scientific age. In that case, we could establish and extend the power of dominion of the human race itself over the universe, render ourselves the masters and possessors of nature. And the Europeans who did that also considered themselves conquering not just nature, but other continents with this um, notion of exploitation as the core source of values. And that exploitation, that um, domination, by the West <clears throat> led to our modern dominant system of values that we all see around us right now. It's the modern story of separation that tells us that nature is a machine, that humans are separate from nature, that humans are separate from each other, that human progress arises from the conquest of nature, that the earth is a resource to be used for human benefit and that the purpose of life is to get wealthy, and powerful. Those are the key stories that have led to this modern situation where we're ransacking the earth um, and this terrible existential crisis of climate breakdown. So just last week <clears throat> came another report by uh, top scientists warning of the ghastly future of mass extinction and climate disruption unless we do something about it. So what can we do about it? Can we move towards a great transformation in human history to a more flourishing future. Well, in my view, the key to this lies in this <clears throat> finding that culture shapes values, values shape history, and our values will shape the future. 
So what we need above all is a transformation in values, an emphasis on the quality of life rather than material possessions, prioritizing progress in quality, not quantity of things, basing our political, social, and economic choices on a sense of our shared humanity, emphasizing justice and dignity for all, and building civilization's future on the basis of symbiosis with the living earth, where the flourishing of the natural world is a foundational principle. <clears throat> now, this shift in values is what I explore in my upcoming book. It's going to be published in June 2021 called The Web of Meaning, Integrating Science and Traditional Wisdom to Find Our Place in the Universe. And what I show in this book is that that modern story of separation that I took you through is not just dangerous, leading us to destruction, but it's plain wrong. It's based on an outmoded set of ideas from that scientific revolution time period, hundreds of years ago, that have been shown by modern science to be wrong. And what we see <clears throat> instead is that if you take some of the findings of recent science in recent decades, neuroscience, complexity science, evolutionary biology, system sciences, they lead to, the, they point to the same deep truths that traditional wisdom has been pointing to for millennia in indigenous knowledge, Taoism, Buddhism, and other <clears throat> wisdom traditions of our intrinsic connectedness. Um, and so from that, um, we get to see the possibility of a new root metaphor for this great transformation we need that I call the web of meaning. This recognition that we are deeply interconnected in this deeply meaningful way with each other and with all of life. So in this upcoming book, I look at each of the great existential questions that we humans ask at some points in our lives, like who am I, where am I, what am I? How should I live? Why am I? And in each case, I show how the way in which our modern culture answers these questions is just fundamentally wrong. And there is a different answer that um, this way of interconnectedness can lead us to coming to. Now, I'm going to take you through just a couple of these <coughs> pointers in the rest of this presentation to give you a sense of where, what I mean in terms of where this is going. So let's <coughs> look at this um, question. Who am I? Well, uh, one of the most powerful uh, uh, spokespeople for the modern, this kind of modern story of separation is Richard Dawkins, who answers this question, who am I, by referring to the selfish gene. He talks about how we and all other animals are, are machines created by our genes in a highly competitive world. And as a result, a predominant quality to be expected in a successful gene is ruthless selfishness. And that's, um, and that's how we need to understand who we are. And maybe we can overcome that through <clears throat> like fighting our intrinsic nature. But in fact, what modern um, biology shows is that the opposite is true. If you look at life itself, since it first began billions of years ago on earth, every one of the major increases in complexity of life to complex cells, multicellular life, animals and mammals have been the result of increases in cooperation between different organisms um, that learned how to <clears throat> optimize symbiotically with others. Um, so that in the words of um, biologist Linmar Golis, life did not take over the world by combat, but by networking. And of all species, one of the paragons of that um, ability to network together is actually humans, far from being <clears throat> these selfish, rational optimizers that modern neoliberal tells us we are, humans actually evolved to be cooperative. Back <clears throat> in the earliest days as we, in our evolution, humans were vulnerable to predators. Those who learned to collaborate with each other were the most successful. And their identity expanded from just self and kin to include the entire group. And so, in fact, um, what evolutionary biologists and cognitive biologists show us is that the human ability to cooperate with each other, even those who are not kin, is what differentiates us from other primates. And from that, 
we humans evolved what are called moral emotions and things like compassion, guilt, shame, gratitude, embarrassment. These are all things we feel deeply and we don't just act morally because we think we should, because we're trying to overcome those selfish genes, but we do it because it feels right. <clears throat> so let's just take a look at and something that leaves from this, and one of these other great existential questions, how should I live? Well, we get some great pointers from indigenous wisdom who took some of those core moral emotions that we just looked at and developed them into sophisticated ways of living together in community in harmonious ways, actually relating to those moral emotions. So a modern scholar, indigenous scholar, a, a Comanche woman, Madonna Harris, <coughs> studied this extensively and looked at not just uh, Native American traditions, but indigenous traditions around the world and identified what she calls the four R's of indigeneity. Um, relationship that recognizes the value in all in relationship with all life. Responsibility, like the imperative to nurture and care for relations reciprocity to balance what is given and taken and redistribution, the sharing obligation to share what one possesses in abundance. And we see this <clears throat> all over um, indigenous cultures. In Africa, see this core concept of Ubuntu, which roughly translated means I am because you are. And from that perspective, the in our modern world's neoliberal sort of sense of self-seeking behavior would be considered a form of madness. Um, similarly, in the Lakota, um, here in um, what's now North America, there's this core concept that's mitakuye oyasin, which basically means we are all related, referring not just to all the people around in community, but all of life. And we see these ideas elaborated in uh, traditional cultures around the world. So um, in, um, in China, um, there was this incredible, uh, an incredible syncretic philosophy called Neo-Confucianism from about a thousand years ago. And one of their core philosophers, Chen Zai, this great expression of what they call run, which is a concept of sort of um, unconditional love. And he made this famous statement, heaven is my father and earth is my mother. And I, a small child, find myself placed intimately between them. What fills the universe I regard as my body. What directs the universe I regard as my nature. All people are my brothers and sisters. All things are my companions. And in modern times, <clears throat> we see these ideas expressed in a sense of like ecological ethics. Some, many people will be familiar with Aldo Leopold who said, a thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability and beauty of the biotic community. It is wrong when it tends otherwise. Similarly, um, the great humanitarian Albert Schweitzer <clears throat> and developed what we can think of as a life-based value system um, based on this concept of recognizing that I, each of us can say that I am life that wills to live in the midst of life that wills to live. And a parallel uh, theme we see in deep ecology, this concept of we are nature and a great philosopher of that, Arne Ness, talked about the concept of an ecological self. We may be said to be in and of nature from the very beginning of ourselves. And that can be expressed in terms of actions, political actions. There's this great slogan I saw in Paris during COP21, um, we are not fighting for nature, we are nature defending itself. Probably best summarized by Albert Schweitzer, who um, said at one point, I cannot but have reverence for all that is called life. That is the beginning and foundation of morality. So uh, one final point that we can look at in terms of <clears throat> some of these existential questions we ask and where that can lead um, is this core question, why am I? A question about purpose. Now the classic um, modern uh, answer to that based on a reductionist science <clears throat> is like from this Nobel laureate, Stephen Weinberg, who talks about the pointless universe. He quotes, um, the more the universe seems comprehensible, the more it also seems pointless, he says. 
that's the classic expression of this understanding uh, uh, that we think is scientific, but is actually based on outmoded 17th century scientific thinking. When we start to think about the universe from a systems perspective of connectedness, we get to realize that meaning itself can be a function of that connectedness. That as the number of connections in a system increases, they lead to phase transitions and the emergence of new meaning. So you can just think about this in terms of looking at things that we're used to in our lives all around us. When words connect, language emerges. When organisms connect, an ecosystem emerges. When neurons connect, consciousness emerges. And probably everybody watching this is familiar with some kind of peak experience that you've had in your life where you've gotten that sense of this deep connectivity, that sense of deep meaning coming arising from the oneness of all you, we feel in all creation. And that sense of oneness is validated by what modern science tells us about the world. And it has implications of connectedness. The implications are that everything you do in your life creates ripples which affect everything else in the universe. This deep principle of the ultimate connectivity of everything in the universe. And from that, we recognize that we exist in an ocean of connectedness. Those ripples begin with each, within each of us. And the choices we make, the personal choices and actions, choices we make to participate in regenerative community, choices we make to engage in the broader political process, choices we make to move towards a plant-based diet and all that that implies. Those are the choices <clears throat> that ultimately weave the web of meaning, this core new metaphor for a great transformation. Those are the choices that together we can work with others to help regenerate our beautiful, fragile earth, the way it's calling for. So I just leave you with this question to ponder after this presentation is over, in terms of your own life, in terms of not just the these choices to go towards a plant-based diet, but in all those aspects of this interrelated web of meaning, what precious strands are you weaving in the web of meaning? So thank you very much. Uh, these are the books I've been referring to, The Patterning Instinct, The Web of Meaning, and uh, you can find out more about my work on these websites, uh, jeremylent.com, Patterns of Meaning is my blog, and theology.org refers to a nonprofit institute um, looking at these, this worldview of interconnectedness. So I will now um, get out of the screen share and <clears throat> just like to thank you for your participation. Thank John for inviting me to be part of this panel and look forward to the discussion uh, very soon. Thank you, bye. Well, that was deep. Well, what, I, what I'd like to know is but Jeremy is uh, where we're at now is a system of individuals and capitalism and getting ahead. Uh, do you see us heading in, a, in the direction of connectiveness? You know, I think right now uh, we're at this choice point that almost like a bifurcation point in our global society. And I see so many forces towards that global connectedness, that sense that we as humans are having for the first time really in, in history, thanks to the internet, thanks to uh, our ability to share the cultures all around us, we have this really shift in consciousness towards a sense of planetary consciousness, a sense of our shared humanity and being part of life, just like we were talking about. At the same time, we see this horrendous juggernaut of destruction taking place. And we see this, um, the destructive um, elements from this neoliberal economy that's, uh, that's taken over the world, causing so many people around in different countries to feel alienated, dispossessed, and then get stirred up uh, to then um, get into these um, putting up m more barriers and feeling separate from each other and feeling this hatred and prejudice. So we see these different directions. And part of what I feel is so important, like I was saying at the end of this presentation, actually each of us is an agent in determining which direction we take this century, because it's only through the forces of connectivity that they can overcome those other forces of separation towards that that flourishing potential. Well, tell me, what do you see? Uh, what do you see uh, 
causing us, I, I think, you know, I started thinking about uh, iPhones and computers and that kind of interconnectedness. But do we need uh, religion, a new religion? Do we need a new government uh, regulations? How are we going to get ourselves from a society that is destructive and is self-centered to one that will cooperate and make the kind of changes we need to have made? But with, with, uh, with the fossil fuel industry, it's government regulation that's doing it. But to get people to change their food, I don't know, what are we going to do, education? How, what, do you see any tools that we can be focusing on? I do. I think that the most important tool actually begins within each of us. It begins with our heart. It begins with our sense of being part of life, just like I was describing that beautiful quote from Albert Schweitzer, I am life that wills to live in the midst of life that wills to live. And and going back to those moral emotions I was describing that are actually a part of our shared humanity, that sense of compassion, that sense of sharing with each other, with community. And so all what our media, what our, our, our corporate driven media trying to turn us into these computer zombies has to do is essentially, it has to condition brainwash every newborn human being to undo, to forget who they truly are as human beings and become part of this consumer system. So I think it has to begin with ourselves, with us really listening to what our hearts are truly telling us, our desire to actually have quality of life, quality of connection, a beautiful earth around us, and to start to notice the messages that are given to us by our mainstream media and to start to actually speak with others, just like we're doing in this kind of um, talk today, connecting with others, recognizing that it's not just me who's a little bit, bit crazy with these ideas of wanting to connect, but actually everyone else around me is feeling the same way. It's just this corporate driven, profit driven uh, media is actually telling us something that is false. We can believe in ourselves and connect with each other. Well, I'm gonna push you and, and also the audience. What does this have to do with psychedelic experiences? Um, well, I'll, I'll share um, my own uh, perspective on that is that um, actually I think that psychedelic experiences uh, of which I've had some in my, um, in my life, when they're approached with an intention to really learn, to really deconstruct some of these messages, to really connect with what's really meaningful in life um, and done so within the right set and setting and right context can be very helpful in helping to sort of decondition these things that uh, are that cause our lives to be so fragmented and so broken apart right now. They can also, they can also be misused in, uh, as, as we're all aware. And so they have to be taken very, as a real sacred sacrament, if you will, have to be treated with a great deal of respect and care and intentionality. And then I think they can have a very positive part to play in this kind of transformation we're talking about. Because that's one of the universal messages that I get from the psychedelic world is that uh, people individually experience a oneness, a experience of connectedness to the rest of the universe. And I have to tell you, as I'm listening to your presentation, uh, you know, that's one way I can understand what you're saying is, uh, you know, maybe you can have the psychedelic experience or a religious platform, but what, what we're talking about is, is a whole new world of uh, psychedelics be opening, opening up our society. And there's some people who say, not that I've intended to get into this, and I certainly don't want to stretch you too far, but there's a whole part of our scientific understanding that says that this is going to be what's going to help us change as population, and has already. Mm -hmm. to, to understand this oneness. Uh, anyway, I, uh, I think you're what, absolutely right there, John. And, and I, I would just add that actually um, there are research projects being done in the UK and in the United States, actually um, using neuroscientific tools to look at people's brains when they are taking uh, things like psilocybin and other psychedelics. And what they see is so fascinating because what they see is the usual ways in which the brain connects gets kind of defragmented and it, it gets way more connected. All kinds of connections that don't usually take place happen in the brain of somebody who is on a psychedelic. And so I think that goes to this notion of connectivity, that what they actually do is they help us to reconnect with these deeper interweaving of all the different elements of our life that our, uh, our normal mainstream culture tells us are separate. So I do think that's a very important uh, point you raise. 
Well, it's uh, something I think will help a lot of people understand your talk. Heather, you have some comments or questions to, to Jeremy? Well, I just, I mean, I kind of along the same lines, but you know, as you were talking, I'm picking up things, networking, cooperative, connection, you know, just this unity that we have. And I feel like there's such a disconnect right now. And psychedelics aside, I think, you know, these types of conferences, just like you said, of you realizing that you're not crazy and there are other people out there thinking the same thing you are, is just so powerful. And, you know, I really feel like we need to get back to that connection and that networking um, that human beings thrive on and somehow we've lost that. So thank you. Yeah, yeah, th th thank you, Heather. And, and something that I'd add to that in terms of that sense of connectivity is even, you know, certainly in the United States, we're dealing with so much of this polarization of politics and values and all that stuff. And I think that people who are more on the progressive side also can fall prey to then starting to other those people who voted for the party they, they we, we don't like or voted against democracy and then start to view them themselves as being intrinsically bad or whatever. And so I think that one of the most important things that we can do um, is you know, stay very focused on the, the important ideals and values we care about, but really reach out to the humanity of those people who have been hurting so badly um, as a result of things that have gone wrong in our society that they don't know where to turn and really offer love and compassion even while we're uh, really striving hard for what we believe is right. All right, well, thank you. We're gonna get back together uh, with Jeremy and the rest of the speakers in about, uh, oh, let's see, we've got about an hour and then we're gonna get back together and hopefully you formulate some real important questions for Jeremy because he has a very important topic which, uh, you know, how are we going to transform? How, how are we going to make these changes? And, you know, you can get the right questions for Jeremy and help him give us the right answers. Uh, I'd like to go on to um, our, yeah. Well, like a lot, a lot, I, this is such a different day, Heather, than we ever put on before. Uh, you know, our last presentation was the speakers that really addressed what was going on in the environment, the burning of the rainforest, you know, the acidification of the oceans, the storms, the carbon dioxide, et cetera. And we're, we're going to get back into a little bit of that towards the end of the presentation. Uh, but our next, uh, our next presentation, again, is a very, very personal one and uh, brings down uh, at, a, at a level that I think we'll all be emotionally touched. And this presentation is by a registered dietitian that I've known for probably 15 years, and we work together and Many years ago, uh, both of us confronted the protein myth, the idea that uh, protein was an important nutrient or the most important nutrient. And she understood and does understand today, and I certainly understand well, that uh, you can't design a protein deficient diet. And you know, it's, it's, it's a myth gone wrong. It's been taken, taken advantage of by the industries. Everything you buy these days that has to do with food uh, focuses on protein, protein, protein. Anyway, I know you're going to enjoy our next pre presenter, and uh, I've enjoyed our friendship for many years. And I've heard, I've heard her tell this story about a very important part of her life, and I'm glad she gets to present that story of what she's done and what contributions she's made, and, and how she's uh, touched the world, and from a very distant point of view, very distant geographically point of view, Brenda, Stav Brenda Davis is going to help us connect uh, with this subject of food and planetary destruction because it's happening to some people around the world more than others. So Heather, let's uh, hear what Brenda Davis has to say. Okay, here we go. Hello, um, I'm just absolutely delighted and honored to be a part of this John McDougall Climate Change Conference. Uh, as you may know, I am not a climate change expert. I am a registered dietitian, but I believe I have a story to tell that is quite compelling. The title of my presentation is Red Alert, Triple Threat, the story of the Marshall Islands. Many of you are likely well aware that climate change affects everyone but it affects poor people in low income communities and developing countries disproportionately. For these individuals, a flood, a drought, 
or depletion of soil, water, or air quality can be economically and socially devastating. But the most vulnerable of all are people living on low-lying island nations, such as the Republic of the Marshall Islands. Where are the Marshall Islands? Well, you likely know where Hawaii is and Australia. The Marshall Islands are somewhere in between. They're about 2,300 miles southwest of Hawaii and about 3,300 miles northeast of Australia. As you can see, there's not a lot of large land masses anywhere close to the Marshall Islands. There are, um, the Marshall Islands are a collection of about 1,200 low-lying islands scattered across an enormous 750,000 square miles of ocean. So they're very spread out. They're grouped into 29 coral atolls and five coral islands. The average elevation is less than six feet. Threat number one, not surprisingly, is climate change. How does climate change affect the Marshall Islands? Well, as temperatures rise, storms become more extreme, coral bleaching events increase, ocean acidification compromise, compromises coral growth and structure, and ocean ecosystems are threatened. As sea levels rise, flooding risk escalates, sedimentation runoff smothers reefs, soil is damaged, and plants that rely on freshwater are threatened. Salt water infiltrates the fresh water that the people rely on. And the consequences of all of this for the Marshallese people are beautifully articulated in this quote by Tony de Bruyne. Anything that the sea does is felt immediately by our people. As the tide comes in a lot higher than it used to, it begins to affect life as we know it not only as to where you can live or have a family, but also where you can grow your food, where you can draw your water, and where you can bury your dead. The solutions, elevate or relocate. To elevate brings with it huge economic burden and environmental losses. To relocate brings with it loss of home, loss of culture, and loss of identity. This quote from Hilda Heine, the RMI president from 2016 to 2020 really brings the relocation bit home. Complete outbound migration and the abandonment of the islands would have profoundly detrimental impacts on the preservation of Marshallese culture and territorial and political sovereignty. She goes on to add, as only one of four low-lying coral atoll nations in the world, the failure of the international community to adequately respond to the global climate crisis of its own making holds particularly grave consequences. How many years does the Marshall Islands have? Without dramatic adaptation, such as elevating land, experts estimate that the Marshall Islands will be uninhabitable by mid-century. Many experts estimating between 2030 and 2050. While adaptation is possible, it would cost about a billion dollars, money that the Marshallese government does not have. External funding falls woefully short. Many believe the Marshallese should just re relocate as it's hard to justify a billion dollar expenditure for less than 60,000 individuals. And if this should come to pass, it would not be the first time that the Marshallese people experienced forced migration. And that brings us to threat number two, nuclear fallout. This quote by John and Jane is a very profound. A soldier told us our lives were smaller than a fingernail. They used us as guinea pigs. Between 1946 and 1948, 
The United States government did 67 nuclear tests and 12 biological weapon tests in the Marshall Islands. This set an historical precedent for USAID. The people of Bikini and Anahuitac atolls, and these are atolls in the very far northeast of the country, had to evacuate their homelands and these individuals and their offspring remain in exile to this day. Nuclear and biological testing contaminated the soil and water, rendering these islands unfit for habitation. Marshallese suffer among the highest rates of cancer and radiation related birth defects in the world. Reparations have included millions of dollars over many years. In 1983, a compact of free association was signed giving the US sole responsibility for international defense. It gives residents of the Marshall Islands the right to emigrate to the US to work there and to join their military. But unfortunately, the legacy lives on in the Runnet Dome. The Runnet Dome, this is one of the um, Anahuitac uh, Atoll Islands built in the late 1970s on an unlined crater in the late 1970s on an unlined crater from a new US nuclear bomb houses 3.1 million cubic feet of US produced radioactive soil and debris, including plutonium. The island debris came from the cleanup of contaminated soils on the test islands and from an irradiated Nevada testing site. The dome is cracking and is at risk of collapsing from rising sea levels and other effects of climate change. Who is responsible? Well, the Nuclear Claims Tribunal, an independent arbiter, ruled in favor of the Marshall Islands, awarding them more than $2 billion in damage. In damages, the US has of yet uh, failed to fund the settlement. For many years, American officials insisted that the Marshall Islands has responsibility for the dome because it's on their land. Former President Hilda Heine asks, how can it be ours? We don't want it. We didn't build it. The garbage inside it is not ours, it's theirs. And that brings us to triple threat uh, number three, type two diabetes. Marshall Islands is in a state of emergency. The Marshallese have among the highest prevalence of diabetes and the highest death rates from diabetes globally. And in 2020, the prevalence of type 2 diabetes was 33.8% in adults ages 20 to 79 years of age. About half of all surgeries on the islands are amputations due to diabetes. Was diabetes a problem in the past? Well, 80 years ago, diabetes was practically unheard of in the Marshall Islands. People were slim, physically active, and they lived off the land. What did they eat? Well, they ate everything that grew on that land from coconuts to bananas and paley leaves, uh, pandanus, breadfruit, and of course, all of the fish and seafood that they could get from the ocean. What do they eat today? Well, today on the main island uh, called Majuro, uh, there are about 30,000 people or about half the entire Marshallese population. Uh, that is too many people on one island to rely on local foods. They don't have enough. So they have to import foods. And because the people are poor, they import the cheapest foods available. Uh, you can see this little girl in the left upper corner. Uh, she's actually eating breakfast at about seven o'clock in the morning, a popsicle and a can of Pepsi. In the middle, um, the school girl is eating a typical school lunch, which is uh, white rice, white sticky rice and uh, chicken. Uh, on, the, on the far right upper corner is a, um, it's a funeral meal of uh, uh, ham sandwich um, a, a, uh, on white bread, a donut, white soda biscuits, uh, sticky white rice and chicken. Uh, and in the bottom uh, lower left, uh, you see a group of Marshallese celebrating a first birthday, which is a huge event there. And the bins contain uh, chicken, uh, some sort of ham, I think, uh, sausages or, or wieners. 
and then uh, uh, white sticky rice. And uh, this is all washed down by the number one beverage in the Marshall Islands, which is called luau. And luau is essentially high fructose corn syrup and uh, food colors and preservatives. Uh, and then in the, in the right, you see turkey tails, uh, turkey tails and other parts of animals that richer people uh, don't want often get shipped to poor islands. And uh, you can see this, this food is, is um, uh, largely fat. And I should also say, going back to this, that uh, a very standard meal is white rice and spam. And uh, so all of these, uh, you know, sort of non-perishables are, are very common foods in the, in the Marshall Islands. And that brings us to uh, the Diabetes Wellness Center. And the Diabetes Wellness Center actually was set up to conduct a research project in 2006 that was uh, basically founded by Canvas Back Missions, which is a medical mission team that has been providing uh, medical teams to help the Marshallese people for decades. Um, and uh, they received a grant from the US Department of Defense to conduct research on diabetes. And uh, the partner in the project uh, was uh, the Marshall Islands Ministry of Health. We were granted uh, this building right here, uh, which is on the left of, of this picture. And, and uh, this building was formerly the uh, TB and leprosy clinic. Uh, and we transformed it into a diabetes wellness center. And uh, the research we conducted was an intensive lifestyle intervention uh, versus usual care. We had 169 Maturo residents with A1Cs of at least eight or who were on diabetes medications. And it was a randomized controlled trial with five overlapping cohorts followed for 24 weeks. And, and the good news for the people that ended up being randomized to usual care, they were all allowed to be part of the intervention, uh, not uh, data that we could use for a study, but uh, to, to go through an intervention to learn how to defeat diabetes using lifestyle. Uh, the lifestyle treatment program, we, we were active for 12 out of the 24 weeks that the participants were followed. And for four weeks, the participants were with us four times a week for about six hours. Uh, for another four weeks, they were with us twice a week for about five hours. And uh, for the final four weeks, once a week for about five hours. And uh, a typical intensive schedule day that included the six hour days uh, would begin uh, with the participants on their own between 7.30 and, and noon. But at seven, they would go for a walk, they would do a blood glucose, then they would have their breakfast, which we provided. We actually provided all the food during the intensive phase. Uh, they would uh, come uh, to the clinic at, at noon, they would have lunch and go for a walk, and then they would come back to the clinic from about 3 to, to around 8.15 or 8.30, and uh, they would do a, 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 a blood glucose test, they would do an exercise class, another blood glucose test, then a cooking class, then they would eat the food they prepared at dinner, and then they would go for a walk after dinner, and then they would do an education session, another blood glucose, and then go home for the evening. This uh, program was actually very comprehensive. It wasn't just about diet. Uh, it was also about exercise, about uh, uh, lifestyle, uh, medicine, education. It was about uh, getting the kind of support they needed, managing stress. Uh, getting enough fresh air and, and uh, not smoking and all of the things that make a healthy lifestyle. Uh, the di diet was a whole food plant-based diet. It was very, it was low in fat, very low in saturated fat, had no trans fatty acids. It was nutrient dense, high in fiber, had a low glycemic load. Uh, we carefully chose very anti-inflammatory food, foods, foods high in antioxidants, low in pro-oxidants, and it contained moderate levels of sodium, probably about uh, 12 to 1500 milligrams a day. Uh, the cooking classes were a way of helping the participants learn how to prepare foods that were not a part of their, their uh, present uh, uh, sort of processed food diet, like legumes and, and vegetables. And the cooking classes were something that our participants looked forward to and very much enjoyed. Uh, 
And uh, we did shopping tours. We worked very closely with the grocery stores to carry more healthy foods. And so we went through and taught our participants how to read labels and how to choose foods that would support and promote health and reverse their diabetes. Uh, we spent a lot of time uh, teaching people to garden, helping them plant gardens in their yards or grow foods in earth boxes. Uh, this was uh, considered extremely important because produce is very expensive in the Marshall Islands uh, because of their remoteness. And so growing foods is really uh, the best alternative for people who don't have a lot of, uh, of funds. Uh, we also did a lot of sprout growing. Sprouts grow very easily in the Marshall Islands and, and certainly we were able to uh, teach them how to grow a variety of sprouts. Uh, daily exercise was absolutely critical part of the program. And, uh, and, and we did uh, exercise classes. Their favorite were dance classes, uh, but we did a variety of exercise classes. Uh, and uh, an absolutely vital part of the program was walking after meals. This made such a difference in uh, blood glucose uh, readings. We, we made it a part of, of, uh, of every, every meal after every meal. Uh, they did education sessions on a variety of topics, of course, food and nutrition and gardening and all of the aspects of lifestyle and chronic disease and, you know, heart disease and, and all, of, all of the other diseases that, that are common uh, in their population. Um, exercise, stress management, dental health, care of eyes and feet, medical management, medications, how to avoid amputations. And, and this uh, Dr. Kamal uh, is a physician from the hospital who performs a lot of the, uh, of the amputation surgeries. And, and he was there talking about avoiding amputations. And so many Marshallese wait until you know, they have gangrene running through their body before they go to the hospital to get checked. And the only thing the surgeon can do uh, to save their lives is amputate a limb. And so he was talking about getting, you know, to see him earlier and how he could help them to, to avoid uh, amputations and the steps they could take to do that as well. Uh, and so our results uh, in the first two weeks, uh, we were just absolutely floored by how fast the human body starts to heal itself. But the pain in the joints, arms and legs was reduced or eliminated. They were able to sleep through the night. They had increased energy. Uh, they were no longer constipated and constipation was a huge issue here because they were eating about five grams of fiber a day. And, and many people you know, would go for a bowel movement once a week. We had one man in our first uh, intervention group that, that hadn't been for a bowel movement in 13 days. And so when you go from five grams of fiber to 50 or 60 or 70 grams of fiber, uh, that changes everything. Uh, they were able to think more clearly and 90% of our participants discontinued their diabetes medications. Uh, just to give you a little uh, idea of the lab results, uh, fasting uh, glucose was down by about 71 milligrams per deciliter at two weeks and about 48 uh, milligrams per deciliter at 12 weeks. A1C went down almost two points at 12 weeks and HSCRP, a measure of inflammation, was down about 1.2 points at both two and 12 weeks. So these, these uh, results are actually quite impressive. Uh, in 2007, our research, research grant ran out, but our, our determination to help the Marshallese people did not. And we continued to come back every year or two, and, and we set up a permanent uh, a diabetes wellness center and a wellness center generally in the Marshall Islands. And um, we, we shifted our focus away from research to, to education in the community. Uh, this says, I, I choose smart foods, uh, this little bracelet these children are wearing. And this came from the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. One of their uh, leading diabetes experts, Carolyn Trapp, came uh, with me to the Marshall Islands uh, to do work there uh, back in, I can't remember if it was 2000. 10 or 12, something like that. Uh, we formed a number of vital partnerships, including uh, with the Min Ministry of Health and the, and the Marshall Islands uh, government and, uh, and with restaurants and grocery stores. Uh, many restaurants have wellness approved uh, uh, items on their menus. And as I mentioned, the, the grocery stores are carrying a lot more produce than they used to. Uh, and we, in order to um, retain our staff at the clinic, 
we started a wellness restaurant so we could provide uh, healthy food uh, to the people at a very reasonable cost. Uh, we turned every crack and crevice that was unused at the hospital into hospital gardens and were able to use the foods that were grown uh, to supply food for the restaurant. And uh, we did a lot of community outreach. So working with church congregate, congregations and community groups and school boards and, and school students. And, and this picture in the lower right uh, in 2017, uh, my uh, dear friend, Margie Colclo and I went into the Marshall Island. She's a speech pathologist and, and uh, a wonder woman when it comes to children. And we uh, actually were asked by the, uh, by the Marshall Islands Ministry of Education to create a, a curriculum for kindergarten to grade six. And we created a curriculum and went into the schools and trained every teacher in the public school system and did activities with the children uh, to teach them about uh, healthy foods. And uh, we continued to do uh, free exercise classes uh, free lifestyle interventions. And uh, this intervention, I went back uh, to do uh, an intervention for the Ministry of, uh, or for, I should say, the Nidagella, including uh, uh, most of the uh, ministers uh, and senators in uh, the Nidagella. So it was uh, a, a really fun intervention to do. This is the Minister of, of Education here. And uh, we did uh, just want to give you a little bit of an idea how these two week interventions went. In 2014, our Majuro intervention, we saw an average fasting glucose drop of 119 milligrams per deciliter. Just unbelievable. In eBuy, average fasting glucose dropped about 50 milligrams per deciliter. eBuy is a much, much smaller island than Majuro, and they have very, very limited access to fresh food. Uh, again, in 2016, uh, we did the, uh, we call uh, the 177 Bikini Island uh, people, 36 uh, participants, and their average fasting glucose dropped 63 milligrams per deciliter, but we had over 11 participants that had drops of over 100 milligrams per deciliter, so that was wonderful. You know, and I, and I have to say, these people are pioneers of the, of the Pacific. Uh, the participants in these in in interventions provide hope amid a very deep sense of hopelessness on the islands. They have proven that diabetes can be defeated with healthy food and exercise. They have succeeded despite the poor quality of their produce and the lack of resources. They have persevered amidst mountains of spam, ramen noodles, fried chicken, and sticky rice. And they have managed with few gyms and no walking trails. And they have set standards for diabetes treatment on many neighboring islands. And here is the good news. All things are connected. Plant-based diets decrease the risk of obesity, diabetes, and other chronic diseases. They reduce pain, suffering, and death in animals and in people. And they dramatically diminish greenhouse gas emissions. Most people know that in order to reduce our carbon footprint, we need to switch from fossil fuels to renewable energy. We need to consume less and waste less. But fewer people know we need to stop eating meat. Climate scientists agree that animal agriculture is either a major source of greenhouse gas emissions or the major source of greenhouse gas emissions. Estimates of how much animal agriculture adds to greenhouse gas emissions range from about 14 to 87%. And the more we learn, the more it seems that the higher end of that range is really where, uh, where it lies. We know that it takes 1.3 acres to feed one person a standard American diet for a year. That same one three point acres of land could feed 14 people eating a plant-based diet. And you can see why when you look at the, the um, carbon footprint of a variety of foods, the, the, this actually looks at 
the kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalents per kilogram of product produced. And you can see at the top of this list is beef at 60 kilograms of carbon dioxide per kilogram of beef, and then uh, lamb and mutton cheese and, and dairy herd beef. Uh, and then you, you do see some plant foods like, like chocolate and coffee and palm oil, but the vast majority of, of the items in the top half of this chart are, you know, are animal products, prawns and pig meat and poultry and, and fish and eggs. The bottom half of the, of the chart is, is largely uh, plant foods. And if you go to the very bottom of the chart, uh, nuts, and nuts actually have a negative land use change figure because tree nuts are currently replacing crop plants uh, and carbon is stored in trees. So it's, um, it's, it's uh, quite interesting. One kilogram of nuts produces about 200 times less greenhouse gas emissions than a kilogram of beef. And, and it becomes really obvious when you look at a chart like this, that we've got to eat lower on the food chain. There was a study by the UK Oxford Martin School uh, that was uh, reported in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences that uh, determined that by 2050, greenhouse gas emissions would be cut by 29% if people followed global health guidelines to eat more fruits and vegetables and less meat, sugar, and calories. And by 70% if everyone went vegan. Their recommendation, a global shift to a plant-based diet. The Eat Lancet Commission from 2019 uh, asked the following question, can we feed a future population of 10 billion people a healthy diet within planetary boundaries? And their answer was, yes, we can. And in this document, they said, food is the single strongest lever to optimize human health and environmental sustainability on earth. The data are both sufficient and strong enough to warrant immediate action. Delaying action will only increase the likelihood of serious and even disastrous consequences. And the Eat Lancet Commission strategy number one was to seek international and national commitment to shift towards healthy diets. And the way they defined healthy diets was increased consumption of plant-based foods, including fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, and whole grains, while substantially limiting animal source foods. There is no more powerful step that any individual can take towards the preservation of this planet than adopting a plant-based diet. The Marshall Islands triple threat is one we need to be aware of. More than any nation in the world, the Marshall Islands faces three of the greatest threats to humanity, climate change, nuclear fallout, and lifestyle-induced chronic disease. And some people might say, why should we care? And I would say we should care because we are responsible. As human beings, we are responsible. And we should care because the future of life on this planet depends upon it. Becoming plant-based is not an option. It is an ecological imperative. I am not certain that the shift alone would be enough, but I am very certain that without this shift, our planet's fragile life support systems will crumble. Our choices matter. They matter to our children, our grandchildren, and all those who are a part of our circles of compassion. They matter to our neighbors, our communities, and our nations. And they matter to those who live an ocean away, but for whom our choices are life and death decisions. And I would like to end my presentation with this UN, uh, with this poem by a 26 year old Marshallese poet presented at the UN Climate Summit. <laughs> 
dear Matafele Benu, you are a seven-month-old sunrise of gummy smiles. You are bald as an egg and bald as the Buddha. Your thighs that are thunder, shrieks that are lightning, so excited for bananas, hugs, and our morning walks along the lagoon. Dear Matafele Benu, I want to tell you about that lagoon, that lucid, sleepy lagoon lounging against the sunrise. Men say that one day, that lagoon will devour you. They say it will gnaw at the shoreline, chew at the roots of your breadfruit trees, gulp down rows of your sea walls, and crunch through your island's shattered bones. They say you, your daughter, and your granddaughter too, will wander rootless, with only a passport to call home. Dear Mata Filipina, don't cry. Mommy promises you, no one will come and devour you. No greedy whale of a company sharking through political seas. No backwater bullying of businesses with broken morals. No blindfolded bureaucracies gonna push this mother ocean over the edge. No one's drowning, baby. No one's moving. No one's losing their homeland. No one's gonna become a climate change refugee. Or should I say, no one else. To the Carteret Islanders of Papua New Guinea and to the Taro Islanders of Fiji, I take this moment to apologize to you. We are drawing the line here. Because baby, we are going to fight. Your mommy, daddy, boo boo, dimma, your country, and your president too, we will all fight. And even though there are those hidden behind platinum titles who like to pretend that we don't exist, that the Marshall Islands, Tuvalu, Kiribati, Maldives, and Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines and floods of Pakistan, Algeria, and Colombia, and hurricanes, tidal waves, and earthquakes didn't exist, still, there are those who see us. Hands reaching out, fists raising up, banners unfurling, megaphones booming, and we are canoes blocking coal ships. We are the radiance of solar villages. We are the rich, clean soil of the farmer's past. We are petitions blooming from teenage fingertips. We are families biking, recycling, reusing, engineers dreaming, designing, building, artists painting, dancing, writing. We are spreading the word. And there are thousands out on the street marching with signs, hand in hand, chanting for change now. They're marching for you, baby. They're marching for us. Because we deserve to do more than just survive. We deserve to thrive. Dear Mata Filipino, you are eyes heavy with drowsy weight. So just close those eyes, baby, and sleep in peace. Because we won't let you down. You'll see. Uh, thank you uh, so much uh, for writing that poem, Jetnil. And uh, we, uh, what a what a powerful uh, way to end uh, a presentation. I would like to say Komaltara, uh, thank you uh, to uh, everyone who is participating in this conference, and Komaltara for what you're doing to save this planet. Well, <laughs> I had to put my Kleenex away. Thank you, Brenda. Uh, you know what um, I hope you understood is that Brenda Davis is the reason that the Marshall Islands have had this kind of experience. I mean, she's been the backbone. She's a very modest person, but it's her dedication that uh, has not only given uh, these people a chance, but also given us this very powerful message. You know, it's kind of hard to relate to destroying the whole planet, but to look at an individual population of people, we can relate to that. Maybe, maybe this is the way that we get people motivated to change. So, uh, <clears throat> Brenda, you, you presented the data. I don't, I don't know what else I have to ask you. It was so clear your presentation. Are you going back? How many times have you been there? Well, uh, first, I want to say uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to share what's going on in the Marshall Islands because I just have to tell you a story. Um, these people are uh, so precious. Um, 
you know, I can remember first going there and, and just watching the little children. Um, they, they, they make toys out of anything that they can find on the street. Uh, they use, I remember last time I was there, they used um, a, a, a car um, bumper as their slide to slide down some sand. They make their baseball gloves out of cardboard and their bats out of a piece of wood. And and they're just so full of joy. And, and the people there, you think they're going through so much. They are the happiest people I've ever seen in my life. They have nothing. And they, they laugh constantly. They're just so filled with love and joy. And it was just such a pleasure to be there with them. And I also have to say, I was definitely uh, not uh, alone in the work that we did. There were a number of members of this team, including Dr. John Kelly, who was uh, one of the main investigators in Canvasback missions that have just given their hearts and souls to help these people over many decades. My husband, my son uh, came with me and did a lot of the build up. There was a big team and, and uh, we, uh, we just felt like part of the Marshallese culture. And I can remember one doctor that came to help us. He was from New York and he said he was walking back to the hotel in the evening and uh, there are two roads, <laughs> that's it, in the, in, in the area. And, and he took the road that was a sort of the, um, the road through the residential neighborhood. And he said it was about 11 o'clock at night and this gang of teenagers started walking towards him. And he said, I got really scared because in New York, if it's in the middle of the night and a gang of teenagers are walking towards you, uh, it's not good news. <laughs> And he said, as the teenagers got closer, he realized they all had their arms around one another and they were singing. And, uh, and, they, and, and as they approached him, they just started saying, Yakwe, Yakwe, and wanting to know where he was from. And, and they just embraced him, you know, it was, it was he said, he said and, and in that instant, I knew I was in a very different place. <laughs> And, uh, and so that's uh, one of the reasons I feel so passionately about these people is this is their home. It's all they've ever known. And it will be in very short order that it's gone. And that's not fair. Um, and, you know, it is our choices that are making that happen and we can change our choices. And, uh, and so I just, um, I desperately, uh, I, I just desperately want to do what I can do. And I know I'm, I'm so grateful for all of the people in this plant-based movement that are passionate and the intelligent people that we've got uh, speaking. I, I was just so moved by Jeremy's presentation. I'm looking uh, very forward to hearing Godot. And I know we have a lot of brilliance in this movement. And for that, I'm very grateful. And the work you've done over many decades uh, you and your family, John, uh, and continue to do. Um, I can remember, uh, you know, and actually to correct you, we've known each other for probably 25 years <laughs> rather than 15, um, because it happened very shortly after I started writing books, was it, which was in the early 90s. And uh, one of the first books I ever came across um, that, that persuaded me to shift was The Challenging Second Opinion. Um, back in the late 80s. Uh, so um, I'm very grateful for that as well. well. I think one of the most important messages here is that uh, the Marshall Islands are, they're the canary in the coal mine. That they are. You know, it's, it's happening all over. I mean, it, it has touched almost everybody. I can't understand why there's any resistance at all out there. I can't understand why there are any, any more climate deniers you know, it's beyond me uh, that this continues. How, how is the uh, COVID-19 problem in the Marshall Islands? Have you been aware of that? Yeah, they've been very, very protected uh, and they've been very strict. A lot of Marshallese wanting to go home, uh, they're not allowed to go home at all. They're just not letting people in. Uh, so they've been very protected so far, uh, which I'm so grateful for because this is one of the things about the main island that houses over half of the population, which is about 60,000 people. So there's about 30,000 on Majuro. It's 3.7 square miles in area. It's 30 miles long. So it's this long skinny strip of land and uh, people are very, very tightly uh, connected physically. 
And the other island that has about 15,000 people is Ebai. And I believe it's like 0.14 of a square mile. It's, I mean, people are almost living on top of one another on that island. And so uh, it would be a disaster if, if COVID were to enter uh, those islands. Plus they have, they have so many, what we call comorbid diseases. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, often it's uh, discussed on the radio about how people of color have uh, more risk of getting COVID-19 and more risk of complications. And you know, somehow nobody ever answers why this is so. Well, the reason is so is because people of color are sicker. They have the dietary diseases that you were talking about. So in addition to the fact that people live on top of each other in the Marshall Islands, they're just set up for devastating results. Mm -hmm. they, they not, not, not because of their color of their skin, but because, because of the, they, they come to the world just like blacks and Hispanics, they come to the world sicker than the general population of people. Yeah, and in the Marshall Islands, I think, I, I, like a lot of places in the world, people, where people live off the land and have done so for, for many generations, uh, they tend to get sicker more quickly when they start eating uh, unhealthy foods. Uh, their bodies just aren't equipped to deal with that stuff. And so that's what we've seen in the Marshall Islands, that as soon as their diet shifted from living off the land to living off of very cheap processed foods, uh, they, they just get sick very quickly. And Heather, I know you told me that when you watched this presentation, you were in tears too. I was, and I didn't want to do it again. And I, <laughs> I was the second time too, it was terrible. Uh, thanks, Heather. So that was great, Brenda. It, very, very powerful. Thank you. Um, I, I hate to cut you off, but I'm chatting with uh, Guidon and, and he's got a, a time constraint. So we need to All get right. started on his video because I don't want to miss out on any time with him. So we'll, we'll get back with you, Brenda, after. Okay. Sounds great. Okay. Thank well, you. well Gidon, Gidon has made uh, scientific contributions uh, along with many other contributions. He published a paper in 2019 in Scientific America, he along with them, some colleagues which really lays out the, uh, the issues of climate change in relation to animal food intake. So let's move right on in the presentation, Heather. Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for uh, tuning in. Um, I was asked to, uh, by John to talk about uh, my approach to making the world a better place through better agricultural policies and dietary choices. And that's uh, the plan for the next 20 minutes. Um, I wanted to start by thanking John and the McDougall Foundation for the opportunity, for the invitation and for the opportunity to speak with you. Thank you. Okay, so this is the plan. I will start with, uh, with highlighting some of the key geophysical costs agriculture exacts on the environment. Um, and then I will describe to you uh, a, a set of principles that uh, allow you together uh, to perfect uh, both environmentally and nutritionally uh, your diet simultaneously so that there are no conflicts or uh, uh, sort of uh, hard choices to, to make. And in that, I will <clears throat> pr uh, primarily rely on papers that I've written in the last uh, four or five years or so. Um, if you're going to fall asleep uh, after this slide, uh, let me just uh, leave you with the take home message before you do. Uh, and that is as follows. Um, for the most part, the less animal products, the better. There are some exceptions, but they are definitely the exceptions and not the rule. Most important by far, with no, uh, with no distant second to speak of is eliminate beef, beef alone uh, in any kind of, of beef. It makes no difference really. And in some senses, it is even worse uh, to eat um, grass-based beef. 
I also want to discourage very much the fixation that unfortunately uh, pervades the food discussion on local. Local is mostly irrelevant and unimportant. Um, efficiently produced, now that's the new local. That's what one should focus on. So let's talk a little bit about some of the key geophysical effects of agriculture. These pictures are uh, taken from recent bike ride uh, in the fall to near my house, uh, Hawthorne Valley farm in the Hudson Valley. Um, very often people begin and sometimes unfortunately end the discussion about the, the environmental consequences of agriculture um, by emphasizing greenhouse gases. So let's look at this. Uh, agriculture directly contributes 9% of the total US uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And it's broken down. Uh, more than half is due to crops. That's primarily fertilizer and uh, agrochemical production. Livestock is another 40% and the rest is, uh, is fuel. Uh, so it's primarily about producing the animal-based portion of the American diet. Most estimates add to those 9% of direct emissions from agriculture um, additional emissions from other sectors like electricity, like transportation, like industry and so forth. And, um, and so upon adding those, which I show here as those uh, uh, purple wedges, you get something, something like one fifth of the national uh, greenhouse gas emission is due to feeding the nation. It's not small, it's, it's important, but it is not the most important. Uh, what is the most important? Well, for one thing, agriculture dominates land use. So let's look at this. Um, the horizontal axis here is, um, uh, let me move myself, um, percent of total US uh, surface area. So you see the pasture and range uh, account together, uh, grazed forest and so forth, uh, to a third of the entire US surface area. Corn, hay, and other crops that are only grown to feed animals, that's another 18% or so. Total agricultural land use is just shy of one half of the entire surface area of the US. So it, it is by far the most dominant and it, it is, um, it is interesting to note that all the stuff that we actually eat, vegetable, fruit, nuts, that's half a percent. All of those are uh, collectively just uh, under half a percent of the US land area as shown right here in this uh, vertical green line it is very, very little. And we, many of us live in cities and, and, and towns, all of those put together, even with the most generous definition of what is a human dwelling, also amounts to uh, about half a percent. So agriculture really dominates uh, the way we use land. And this is important because most environmental costs of diet and uh, 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 just, rise linearly as the land that they require rises as well. So uh, if you use half of the nation's total surface area, you better know for sure that you are doing it very carefully and judiciously. And the answer today is that we are doing it in the most uh, opposite manner to, to uh, careful and judicious possible. Let's look at some examples of how it actually affects the planet, that land use, okay? Here is a property measured by satellites from space, uh, which is called albedo, which is just the reflectivity. So, so the sun 
uh, shines on Earth. This is what drives the bio, this energy drives the biosphere. And albedo is a measure of how much of that incoming radiation is reflected without being absorbed. And this shows you uh, the change uh, in the reflectivity as a result of modifying the land for whatever human purpose we modify it for. And you see uh, the US that you're probably most familiar with uh, has this dipole pattern where the, the roughly the Eastern half um, became that much more reflective. That's mostly think about uh, a cornfield uh, in Iowa in February covered in fresh white snow. Well, it reflects a lot more than if that were left alone to return to the forest it once was, which is not quite uh, this uh, shiny. Uh, the reverse is true in the more arid part of the American West. Now, if you know anything about climate, you know that the climate of a particular place to a large extent depends on the planetary wave pattern around the globe. The planetary wave pattern is partly forced, in other words, prodded to be, uh, uh, to manifest itself by distribution of uh, uneven distribution of temperature. Such changes contribute greatly to that. So allocating the entire eastern half of the US primarily to corn, soy, and uh, cotton and rice and, and things like that really alters the planetary wave pattern um, and climate. This is a corollary of that, how much of the downward radiation is uh, absorbed. And you see that the Eastern US uh, has uh, a negative, discernibly negative values and the Western has discernibly positive values as a result of land use changes. So it's not at all fanciful to say, you choose to eat in a manner that uh, requires a lot of corn and soy uh, or any large scale agriculture, you change the planetary heat balance, the planetary radiative balance, and the planetary wave pattern, all of those. Biodiversity is another huge impact of agriculture. So here is an estimate <clears throat> from uh, 20 years ago or so. Uh, in recent decades, 50 to 90% decline in European on-farm birds is another early uh, estimate in the 12 years um, that launched the 21st century, <coughs> the USDA killed 1.2 million coyotes because ranchers didn't like them. That's 100,000 coyotes per year. Think about a pile of 100,000 German shepherd carcasses piled together. That's how much we kill every year in the name of, uh, of ranching. And here's one of the even less fortunate denizens of the planet, the Mexican gray wolf, which ranchers all but wiped out. Um, some people maintain that beef, when uh, used, uh, when fed uh, grass or, or when is based on grazing, uh, is some kind of a panacea for uh, biodiversity. That unfortunately is not true. And let me show you an example here. Uh, from uh, PNAS, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, where we take the biodiversity of natural uh, rangeland and whatever biodiversity it is, we call it unit. That's 
are one, okay? So that is that natural and it gets the value of one. Everything else has lower biodiversity. We take the biodiversity of those lower values divided by the biodiversity of the unperturbed rangeland and we get a ratio. What is that rate ratio? Moderately used rangeland has lost already 40% of its biodiversity. Intensively used lost half. Man-made grasslands, which I apologize for the term, that's the term that they use, but, uh, but, but that means uh, places that are now grassland that would otherwise not be grassland, they would be forest or whatever, that lost 70% of the biodiversity. The notion that range-based beef ranching is beneficial to biodiversity is sharply at odds with reality. And here is a nice summary of that by one of the titans of uh, wildlife biodiversity, uh, Bill Ripley of Oregon State. Uh, and the title just says it all, biodiversity conservation, the key is reducing meat consumption. This person speaks not out of fanciful assertions, but based on careful data collection and analysis. That is the reality. It follows from that, that eating land cheap foods is one of the callings of our time. Land cheap meaning, um, you know, here you have one person who eats uh, a steak let's say it provides uh, 40 grams of protein. You can have the same grams of, uh, 40 grams of protein from lentils. Uh, it will require a minuscule fraction of the land. That's land cheap. Uh, that's what I mean by land cheap. Okay. Um, water pollution and coastal dead zones. Every now and again, you come to any uh, coast uh, of the Gulf Coast of the US and that is what you see, massive die-offs. Why? Um, uh, it, if you dive shallow underwater, you see instead of those beautiful uh, azure water that characterized the Gulf of Mexico, you see this murky uh, green with very, very reduced uh, visibility. And the most important aspect of it is that the, the, this greenness is uh, excess uh, growth of algae uh, which, uh, you know, the Mississippi River is, is mostly heavily cultivated, uh, sorry, uh, mostly heavily cultivated, all the excess inefficient um, fertilizer applied there washes into the Gulf of Mexico, it promotes algal growth, those algae live briefly and then die, and their rotting bodies essentially rub the water column of oxygen, dissolved oxygen. So you see right here, what we call uh, anoxia or dead zone more uh, poetically, which are vast regions with uh, so little oxygen in the water that most marine life just die. So you see uh, open ocean values of the dissolved oxygen would be 10 to 100 milligrams of oxygen per liter of seawater. Well, here we see values between zero and five, vastly reduced. And that is directly because of the uh, uh, cultivation of the Mississippi Basin. Um, we have important impacts on, uh, on hydro biogeochemistry. Um, uh, the most uh, important effects that farmers uh, have on the land is uh, they fertilize, they aerate uh, the soil, they tile, not till, but tile. Uh, it, it's uh, sort of a practice that hasten um, 
the removal of uh, precipitation water from the land into the irrigation ditches and then into rivers. And they degrade soil biota by doing all of those uh, things. And of course, applying agrochemicals. Uh, that results in the soil bacteria having much less time to work on and neutralize stuff that farmers apply to the land. So, so you see uh, in this graph, you see the uh, comparison of, of a modified and a natural uh, ecosystem after a rain event, uh, which starts uh, uh, at day zero right here. And you see that the uh, natural one takes a long time to rise to a modest uh, amount of uh, flow. And then it very slowly and gradually dies down back to normal flow. The modified behaves completely differently. It's a huge rapid pulse and a rapid decline back to normal state. This is very reminiscent of the, uh, of, um, the glycemic response to properly chosen food in blue and highly processed uh, simple starches and sugars in green. It's the land equivalent of pre-diabetes essentially. And this is what, again, it looks like uh, in terms of dissolved oxygen near the bottom, very reduced and killing massive amounts of marine biota. Uh, back and, and now to, to uh, the other element of the plan, environmentally and nutritionally perfecting your diet. Uh, and those are basically the choices that we have here. Th this is a nice uh, dish of uh, hummus that I make. I'm from Israel, so hummus is a key element of my diet. Um, that kind of eating is consistent with this kind of beauty. And this kind of eating on the lower right is consistent with this kind of environment. Th that's basically the choice. There is no third option. Um, th this is a paper uh, we published in 2016, I think, uh, asking, uh, quantifying the resources needed to produce one kilogram of animal protein. This, the, the first panel shows you land use and you see beef requires 33 hundred square meters of land allocated per year to produce a kilogram of protein from beef. What about eggs? Something like 30 or 50. You, you see here the, the uh, transparent green, that's the range spanned by various plants. Now you see what land cheap eating looks like. Water, it's less uh, of a clear cut because some things like almonds in the Central Valley or uh, rice in Vietnam, uh, those, uh, excuse me, require prodigious amounts of water. But, but still, beef requires disproportionate amount. You see all the other ones are two, three uh, cubic meters per uh, kilogram of protein. Beef is 37. And we have to always truncate the beef bar or else it will just go to the next town to the right. Here's greenhouse gas emissions. Again, beef 200, all the rest, something like 20, two to 20. And nitrogen fertilizer, the cause of the oceanic dead zones. Again, beef 3,900, all the rest, some, somewhere between three and 500 huge uh, disparity. So what uh, do we conclude here? Um, uh, focus for a minute uh, on, sorry, on the bottom, beef resource needs are at least 10 times larger than those of other animal products. 
other livestock categories are roughly comparable to one another and plants are mostly but not only somewhat too much less resource intensive. Now, against this backdrop, look on the upper uh, right, this very large panel, uh, and see what Americans actually get their calorie, their protein from. And you see that beef contributes 10%. Beef, the, 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 the paragon of inefficiency that should be minimized, hopefully, to zero, that one contributes a full 10%. Uh, poultry is much more efficient, thankfully, and it contributes 15. Um, this is another paper uh, where we are trying to follow the flow of substances into the livestock production enterprise. And, you know, there are different inputs like uh, corn, soybean, hay, pasture, etc. Okay, all of those contribute 36 petagrams or millions of tons of uh, protein from all of those sources into the beef enterprise. And what do we get as actual beef protein? One, 36 in, one out. The efficiency is shown right here, and that is 3%. 97% of all the protein that you put in, just pure loss, 97%. Now, you may ask, suppose I took all of those resources and I allocated them to a sensible, sound, plant-based diet that delivers the same amount of protein. How many more Americans can I support this with? The answer is shown right here. 161 million additional Americans fed in full that's half the nation again. The increase in protein yield that such a transition will result in will deliver 430% more protein. It's a staggering amount. Let's uh, uh, look at a more recent paper uh, where we're trying to take the, uh, uh, the US meat and devise alternative plant-based uh, diet uh, to it. Something like that. You take all of those um, uh, things that fall into this uh, red meat category and uh, replace them with something that, like, like the upper, the lower right, okay? And we strictly enforce uh, more than 40 specific nutrients in the diet that have to uh, uh, at least meet uh, the, uh, the requirements, if not more. What happens if you do something like that? Well, let's start with the environmental consequences. In terms of land, for example, you replace beef alone, you see right here, um, you instead of uh, using 38%, you result, you drop to 11%. So, 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 uh, so the, the, you, you basically cut your land use by two thirds. You only need one third. In, ter in terms of, uh, uh, gram of reactive nitrogen that, that's just fertilizer from 44% of the total US consumption of that resource, you drop down to 10. That's less than a quarter. What about greenhouse gas emissions in panel D? Well, instead of 39, you drop to six. Massive reduction. And in terms of water use, well, only from 
to 13%. What about nutritional impact? This shows you the percent of delivery of specific nutrients as a, 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 a expressed as percent of today's mean diet. So for example, manganese, um, the alternative plant-based diet delivers something like 4.3 times as much manganese as uh, the, uh, the uh, beef it, repl uh, it replaces. Or, or in this case, it's actually all meat replacement. I, I wanna show you that the thing that's important is that when you are larger than 100, this is 100. When you are uh, to the right of 100, it means you get more of that. Well, what is it? Are these things bad for you or good for you? Well, here's folate, beta carotene, vitamin K, vitamin A, soluble fiber, uh, phytosterols, total fiber, magnesium. All of those things are known to be protective nutrients. The corollary, you take your meat, replace it with a sensible and carefully designed plant-based diet, you not only dramatically reduce your environmental impact, you also dramatically enhance your ingestion rate of protective uh, micronutrients. So eating determines your longevity and uh, health span as powerfully as genetics or exercising. We all know that by now. My work shows uh, that that, uh, that with the, sorry, this is a little typo there, but uh, with the right diet, uh, dietary choices, you can greatly reduce your environmental and societal impacts. And this is what I mean by the latter. You get to decide who wins, a hay farmer enabling growing Chinese uh, demand for beef or salmon that depend on those contested waters uh, and the native population that depend on them. That kind of dilemma would correspond to Eastern Oregon, for example, where this is exactly the, two, the, the dichotomy of water allocation being discussed. Or who wins, a Mississippi shrimper whose livelihood has been decimated by those dead zones, or an Iowa corn farmer whose nitrogen-rich effluent kills her catch? Is what's on your plate furthering your health or furthering the health of the major agribusiness corporations? It's your choice. Importantly, health, environmental, and societal considerations often lead in similar directions, but proceed with caution because it is not universally true. Thank you. It was an honor to speak to you. Well, thank you. It was a great, uh, great summary and uh, brought us a little further in our understanding about the impact of simple dietary changes, important dietary changes. Uh, well done. We can get all of our speakers on so we can have a Q&A with everyone. Okay, let, let me have a, just a minute uh, just to see. I got a couple questions for Gideon. Oh, or sure. Gideon, I'm sorry. I, I, um, if we were together a little longer, I <laughs> I get your pronunciation correct. I, I want to ask you a couple of questions that I don't think anybody else could answer, but I at least want to propose to you that have been asked to me. And that is that, um, what, what are we going to do uh, if we decide to go vegan, which obviously we need to do, what are we going to do with all the farm animals? And is this going to pollute the environment? That's, that's uh, one question. And the other question is, again, related to that, what happens is people follow the kind of diet that I recommend and, and 8 billion people lose uh, weight. You know, half of them, 4 billion of them are overweight. What about all the carbon that's released by, uh, by this kind of change, weight loss? Uh, have, have you thought about that? Or this kind of implication, or am I pushing you a little hard? 
No, no, not hard at all. Um, uh, so uh, the weight loss, uh, yeah, it's been calculated. Uh, I didn't do that. Uh, it's a, it's an incredibly uh, modest um, uh, amount. Yeah, I mean, it will contribute a little more uh, uh, carbon in the atmosphere. It's a trivial amount. Um, there, there, uh, there has been a paper uh, about uh, actually exhale, uh, you know, human exhalation. That too is rather trivial. So I mean, yeah, we there, there's maybe seven and a half billion of us. Uh, uh, it's not it's not really uh, the, the the small addition due to to excess excuse me excess weight is is not um, hugely important. What will happen to animals? It's it's really a non-issue. Uh, in other words, um, we will use the one, the, the inventory that currently exists, um, the same way we have been for, for centuries, and uh, not replenish it, and that's it. And uh, th there's really uh, no issue to speak of here. There's one other question, and I ask you, because you're one of the scientists that we have today, one other question that's come up, and that is, uh, <clears throat> what would happen if we uh, solve the pollution problem. And by solving the pollution problem, we eliminate particulate matter. Uh, it's been estimated that by eliminating particulate matter, which would happen in a matter of days, that the planetary temperature would increase at least one degree. Have you heard about that? Yes, um, yeah, so, so uh, uh, things that are uh, uh, par particles in the atmosphere that are rather um, blackish and rather large, uh, both criteria are, are met by, by most uh, tailpipe pollution or smokestack pollution. Uh, if they if they persist near the surface, if they don't go uh, far up into the atmosphere, they um, um, they have. Uh, a, a significant radiative uh, effect. Um, I, I think that the more important, if, if you're going to go down the uh, rabbit hole of uh, particulate, uh, we, which is a very worthy th uh, thing to do, um, you would ask, rather than the question that you asked, you would ask instead, how many lives and pulmonary disease uh, uh, cases are to be saved by reducing particulate. And the answer is very, there is actually a paper uh, uh, right now uh, from the Tillman Group at the University of Minnesota uh, to be published soon at PNAS that addresses this question. And um, it, it's unbelievable, unbelievable, uh, uh, the uh, uh, eliminating um, uh, animal agriculture would save more lives lost to particulate matter related diseases than improving the uh, fleet average uh, gas mileage. Which the reason, was yeah, the reason I, 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 I was a reviewer of this paper, uh, not an author, and I tipped my cap to this paper, uh, to these authors, because it is a very surprising and incredibly powerful result related to particulate. Well, the reason I ask this question is because the argument is, is that we need to lower the temperature by changing our diet first, or at least uh, along with at the same pace that we eliminate fossil fuels. Because if we didn't lower carbon first in the atmosphere by something as simple and as important as dietary change, if we suddenly drop the particular matter, which would happen in a matter of days to weeks at most, the temperature would rise of the planet to an unlivable, uh, unlivable no, uh, temperature. No, no. That's overstating the case. Your, your point is correct. You are overplaying your hand. Okay. Uh, <laughs> the, um, it, it is true, for example, it is well known that the uh, eastern third of the US in the last several decades has been 
significantly warmer than it has been in the past only because of the Clean Air Act. Until Trump, Trump stopped progress, there was a steady progress in, uh, in air quality. And that in turn, because of clearing the air and allowing more surface, uh, more uh, solar radiation to hit the surface, um, that actually resulted in warming. That is warming that societally, any sensible person would say it's a small price to pay for very significant uh, reduction in, in pulmonary emergency care uh, uh, visits. Well, I guess the point I'm trying to make is it makes it even more paramount that we focus on dietary change and lowering the amount of carbon that's being produced. You know, as I say, it has to be done along with, if not ahead of, our efforts to get rid of the particulate matter from all of the combustion that goes on with fossil fuels. Thank you for answering those questions. Those are really tough questions that I have not had anybody answer in the past, and I appreciate your answer. So let's let's invite the rest of the team in, the rest of the speakers for the afternoon, Heather. Absolutely. And Gidon, we understand if you have to leave, you just let us know, okay? Yeah, I have a few more minutes. All right, hello everyone. Hi. Hi. Thank you for all of that. I have some questions that um, have come in. May I start out with one? So I'm with you all the way, but I haven't heard much discussion about what happens to all the farms and businesses that currently produce meat, fish, eggs, milk, et cetera. Are there ideas for solving the economic impact when we get the world to give up those things? Yeah, that's a very, it's a very important point actually. And I'm very sympathetic to that. Um, I, I would say that um, there are work arounds, uh, workarounds uh, uh, addressing that, uh, but it is true that it, it is somewhat uh, of a challenge that, uh, let's say, a thoughtful administration will have to uh, balance, you know, as we pursue aggressively our environmental goals how we balance that with uh, ensuring that uh, any uh, Im negative impact on uh, livelihood of working people is uh, properly offset by, by additional, um, uh, additional uh, policies. I, I, I would say it, this uh, question resonates so much in me that I, I have now multiple papers, uh, really three going on four, um, about various aspects of that. We, we, we basically asking, how can you geophysically and nutritionally um, optimize the, uh, the, present, the, uh, uh, the presence of uh, uh, animal-based farms uh, so as to live within our um, allotted uh, damage, let's say, uh, simply put. Um, it's, a, it's a hard problem. I, I have some answers and, uh, you know, some of those are uh, going to be published any day now and some in a few weeks, a few weeks to months. And uh, people who are interested should check them out and, and reach out if they have further questions on that. Well, let me give you an analogy. Uh, I used to sell books. I go around to radio and TV shows all over the country to sell books to support my family. And uh, I recall one day a, a, a dairy farmer came up, called me up on the radio show and said, you know, you're, you're destroying my family. You're... Uh, you're preventing me from, you know, putting shoes on the kids and paying my rent. What in the heck do you think you're doing? And my response to him was, what if we were talking to a tobacco farmer? You know, what if we were talking about the hazards of tobacco? I said, don't you think the greater good as far as eliminating tobacco would be more important than what happens to you individually? Even though I realize we need to make sure that these people aren't lost and they're taken care of, but you know, it's to the point you were trying to make when I asked you the previous questions. There is a greater good you also have to consider. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm just thinking um, uh, 
there are some reasons why cattle are uniquely important to agriculture. And that is what, what these papers collectively addresses. How do you create a, 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 a set of distributed production such that uh, you optimally take advantage of uh, ruminants on the landscape? And ruminants do have uh, pretty indispensable roles to play in hastening biogeochemical cycles. Um, uh, helpful to uh, land productivity. So uh, some, uh, some caution uh, is warranted uh, here, and that's what those papers try to quantify. And uh, Brendan and Jeremy, do you have anything that you'd like to add to that question? Well, in other words, what do, we, what do we do about the people who are going to starve to death when we, yeah. when we make this dramatic dietary change? Because we're going to do it. Um, I, I think that it raises a, a, a very good point. And I think we need to recognize that, you know, this destructive overall societal context we live in has caused many people to be forced to be engaged in being part of that destruction, even though that might not be their choice if they, if they you know, could like suppose start it all again from the beginning. So I think as Gidan was actually referring to, it's absolutely critical. And this of course is totally true with the green energy revolution and you know, coal miners who are afraid of having their um, lives and their livelihood ended through the transition to renewables. And it's the same kind of thing that we need to approach this recognizing that the people who have been engaged in their livelihood um, that have been as a result causing these destructions are not themselves the fault. And they need to be treated with great respect and a, a big priority needs to be put into investing like state investment uh, into um, allowing people to shift to transition. It's very difficult to do in mid career, whatever you're doing, but to transition to actually uh, those kind of activities that are life affirming. So in the point in the place of in the area of, of agriculture, I think a huge investment in agroecology, a huge investment in permaculture practices, a huge investment in regenerative agriculture and could be made allowing um, people who spend their lives in farms to actually reconsider what they can do. And there are examples of that, of, uh, you know, they're only small examples right now because the whole situation is so much geared towards profit-based and sort of big companies and, and everything else is destroying um, small farms but it's possible for people to um, actually get those new tools and actually be part of the solution rather than part of the problem. But it involves society as a whole to recognize the fault is not with the people who have spent their lives doing that and they need to be invested in as part of that transformation. Uh, brilliantly said. <laughs> and uh, Just uh, here, and definitely not my area of expertise, but I can say here in Alberta where I live, uh, the two key industries are fossil fuels and beef. And right now we are seeing this, uh, you know, transition into getting very interested in, in uh, renewable uh, energy. And also I just saw in the paper yesterday, a uh, big article about how it's absolutely imperative that, uh, that, that uh, farmers and, and, uh, and other folks get involved and, and get interested in, in plant-based protein uh, because it's such an up and coming uh, commodity and, and it's the future. And so we're seeing people getting more interested. And certainly uh, the Canadian government has already um, set aside a, a lot of money to help get plant-based protein uh, in you know, in, in progress. So we, we're seeing a lot of it in, in the prairie provinces. And I think, I think th these changes will happen uh, and people will find uh, whatever, whatever consumers want is what they'll be producing. And that's as simple as that. Thank you. Um, may I bring up another question that came in? Um, can you speak to the Livestock's Long Shadow Report that was published over a decade ago? 
It discusses livestock farming and how it's the number one contributor to greenhouse gases. Are you in agreement uh, with it? Yeah, let me, let me, uh, cause it's, it's something that changed my, my whole way of thinking. You know, you had Al Gore come out with the inconvenient truth in the same year, 2006, you had the World Health Organization, the, the, the World Bank, put out this 417 page report called Livestock's Long Shadow. And uh, considering what they thought was important, they uh, <clears throat> figured, and this was dramatic, and this is world changing. They figured that livestock industry contributed to 18% of the greenhouse gas productions compared to transportation and other energy needs, which was only 14%. So, as I mentioned, the World Watch Institute, they reevaluated the uh, raw data from this World Health Organization report and by including other things like transportation, you know, all, all kinds of factors that uh, weren't considered by the, the World Bank group. They estimated that over 15, over 51 percent of the uh, greenhouse gases are produced by the livestock industry. And, you know, it's, I think it's at least that. And as Brenda Davis said, we're coming up with estimates from uh, Eat Commission that if you change to a vegan diet, there's a 50% reduction in greenhouse gases almost overnight. And other, other researchers who estimate as high as 80% reduction in greenhouse gases by simple dietary changes from the gluttony of Europeans and Westerners and Asians these days back to the traditional diet of people. We're not talking about anything strange. We're talking about getting rid of a diet that we've, it's only been popular for the last 50 to 100 years. Thank you. Um, next question, unless there's anything you would like to bring up, yeah, Dr. McDougall. I've about got what? Well, I've got a question about palm oil. We haven't talked about that. Oh, you know, I, I would rather let, defer that one to, uh, to Brenda Davis or to, uh, our other uh, guests. Let, let me just say um, uh, about uh, livestock long shadow. Um, I never cite this because I don't trust uh, the methodology is hopelessly flawed, and um, and um, I, I take strong issue uh, with that report. Um, uh, and the, the numbers that were kind of thrown around here uh, conflate two distinct measures that have to be very clearly distinguished. One is what is the fraction of total emissions either in the US or globally from uh, agriculture? I address that in, in, in my talk directly, 9% in the US, indirectly call it one fifth, 20%. Uh, no, nothing even remotely uh, close to 50% is, uh, is warranted. Now it is true and, and, and many of my papers show that if you have a particular person carrying out a dietary shift, they can eliminate 80% or so or even more of their food related emissions by this transition. But that's a completely different question than the one asking how much of the total greenhouse gas portfolio is due to agriculture. Uh, the most careful and responsible answer is somewhere between 15 and 22% and definitely not any more than 25. Well, it's, it's certainly substantial. And something that's not being addressed. And of course, that's the purpose of this day long uh, information gathering is to get people to focus on it, whether it's 20% or 50%. I don't think, I don't think the, uh, the actual percentage is going to influence our need to make the change. I mean, it's obvious we have to put this into the equation or we're gonna fail. Absolutely. So can we get back to the question about palm oil? We haven't talked about that, but that's a big one. And, and coconut oil is very popular. Um, so Jeremy, you're nodding your head. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, well, I, I'm actually very glad that question got raised. I, I think um, <clears throat> palm oil is a huge, huge problem. Um, and as the, uh, the question just said, it's actually um, causing massive deforestation 
uh, especially in Southeast Asia. Um, and I think we have to look at the deeper issues around something like um, these horrendous palm oil monocultures that take place. We have to recognize that ultimately what's going on is these big for-profit driven, shareholder owned uh, consumer product companies that want to find a way they can grow their profits as fast as possible. The way that they know that works is to basically trick billions of people's palates into what, be, getting addicted to something that tastes really good that they can buy um, and that can be produced as cheaply as possible. And so these companies essentially turning humans as the consumers who are e eating these like uh, horrendously almost poisonous products and turning the living earth, turning these beautiful uh, primal uh, forests, some of the greatest heritage of all life on earth, turning them into these horrendous like monoculture plantations for profit. And so what can we do? Well, as consumers, one thing we can do is be aware of not buying products that have palm oil in them. And I think politically, we can support yes, some organizations like Greenpeace and the Center for Biological Diversity and other um, activist organizations have actually made really good progress in shaming companies like PepsiCo and others um, around their palm, palm oil focus and gotten them to change some of their policy. But ultimately, these are, even these are small incremental things. We have to look at the root of the problem. We have to look at the elephants in the room that is so big that we don't even like to talk about it, which is this growth-based uh, shareholder-owned companies that, that are basically, and I, th I think I, I talked in, my, in, in, my, in our presentation, the dominant force in our world today that are driven to just keep growing at a faster and faster rate and until we look at the system that's causing that. Uh, even the most aggressive interventions we try to make are small incremental ones compared to the overall problem. So thank you for raising the question about Paul Moyle. Yeah, and no, I'll just add to it. When you think about why palm oil has increased so much in the market, it's we we um, eventually discovered how uh, damaging to human health um, hydro partially hydrogenated fats were, and uh, and so uh, we tried to remove them from the food supply. And in their place, we're using uh, foods with a lot of saturated fat, like palm and coconut oil, because they're quite shelf stable. And, uh, and so to me, it's not a huge sacrifice to avoid foods with added palm oil, because th they're literally uh, the junkiest foods you can imagine. It's highly processed foods that are shelf stable. They're meant to sit on the shelf for two years, it's crackers and, and all of these junk margarines and so forth. And, and so really do, if you're using you know, highly processed foods, at least look at the label and avoid. Um, I think palm oil is, is well, I, I'm, this is again, not my expertise, but I think it has more serious uh, adverse consequences ecologically than even coconut oil would have. Uh, and, you know, I think everybody knows the association with primates and, and what it's doing to the land uh, that they call home. Uh, so just steer clear, please. Uh, before Jidan has to leave, I, I would like to address the number that keeps getting thrown out. When we first started talking about uh, the disasters that were going to occur to this planet, we talked about sometime in the 22nd century. Uh, now, what we're doing is we're using a figure 2050. You know, I find that uh, harmful to think that we have until 2050 to make these necessary changes. Uh, these things have to be done now. What, what, what does the rest of the panel think? Yeah, there's no doubt about that. I mean, we've known that for decades, we just haven't done anything. But why do people keep saying we have until 2050? Yeah, or you know, we're going to get all the all the uh, all the gasoline engines off the road by 2030. Excuse me. You, you know, like in fact, John, um, so scientists around the world are actually they they put the date of 2030, and so basically just in this decade um, to significantly turn things around 
uh, before, in their view, it's so late that we start hitting these um, mut these like reinforcing feedback effects on climate that we're actually like have no chance of uh, of, of turning things around. So um, they are saying that that year, that and when they're saying turn around, they, they're not saying wait until then to start changing our behaviors. They're saying we need to start changing our behaviors radically right now so that over just the next few years, we can actually turn those emissions curves from going up like that to going back down in order to have a chance of getting to that one and a half degree uh, Celsius rising temperature this century. Um, we, and even that would take drastic transformation beginning right now. So I don't think anyone who's looking at this situation thinks it's any time, I mean, we're already decades beyond the place for sort of easeful change. But, but I fear that the consumer he hears the other, they hear that you have until 2050 or 2030 to get this fixed. Uh, you know, that I, that I think it does a disservice to our cause to give people this kind of out. You know, people love to hear that they continue, can continue to do what they're doing. People love to hear good news about their bad habits. And, uh, you know, I, Anyway, I just wanted to bring up that date because I heard it a few times here, 2050, and, and uh, I want to make sure arbitrary. that you clarified it. There is nothing to it. It's purely arbitrary. We, 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 the, the impetus for a radical change, not just in diet, but in every aspect of our interaction with the planet, is decades uh, out of date literally decades out of date. I mean, we've known that in the 70s beginning, the 80s more, 90s with very little doubt, 2000 and on, it was all hands on deck. There was absolutely zero doubt. And um, since that time, which is two decades, we've known that and still, well, in the last four years, we just took a huge step back, but now we'll, gradually catch up to where we were in the mid 90s. Well, there's, there's some good about learning what the bottom can look like. All we have is up to go. Let's hope so. Well, I, I'm just afraid that, you know, it seems like people need to be hit over the head with something before they make change, you know? I mean, so often, when do people come to our live-in program, Dad? It's when they're faced with like, bypass surgery or something major, you know, that's going to happen to them. And I'm just afraid that, you know, we're going to wait until we're getting beat over the head with, although I kind of already feel like we are, but, and it's going to be too late. You know, we're, we're, we're getting the warning signs. Why aren't we acting? Uh, Jeremy, why aren't we acting? Well, I think one of the most important things to do is look at this word, we, that gets uh, <coughs> put out a lot, because, I mean, th this is sort of, classic in these conversations, you know, we knew about this, but we didn't do anything about it. Well, actually, um, we is a very disparate group of people. I mean, we are, um, part of we is the people who have actually, uh, from our lifestyle in the global north, um, and, and all of the affluence we've had for decades of, of this problem. That's May I interrupt for one second? I'm so sorry, but uh, Gidon has to go, and I just want to oh, say goodbye. Okay. Thank you so much for yeah. your time. Great contribution. Thank you. Thank you very much to, for adding to a very successful day. It was wonderful. Thanks. For I, I, I know we'll be in contact with each other again. Very good. No, Looking forward. Yeah, no doubt about it. Take care, everybody. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. <laughs> okay, I apologize, Jeremy, for cutting well, you off. Sure, yeah. Um, but anyway, so, yes, yeah, so, so, we, we, I think it's really important to sort of break down these kind of weeds. It, it's a little bit like sometimes people talk about the Anthropocene. You know, we are, um, we're in the Anthropocene now, which is like this uh, geological era um, that's caused by um, human activity. But then we have to say, well, is it humanity or what is it? And if, so actually most of the people in the world right now who are going to be dealing with it, who are already dealing with the devastation of climate breakdown, didn't actually cause it. Um, and they're actually, and their their generations before them didn't cause it because they're in the global south who have just contributed a tiny amount of these emissions to the world. So that's one way. And then the other way that breaks down, of course, is there are many people who have become 
super aware of these problems, fighting really hard to try to raise awareness. And then you have things like the uh, fossil fuel companies that knew about this even before any of us did. I mean, believe it or not, and there were reports that were being made in the 1980s, 1970s even, to um, the, the actual uh, industry group that includes all the fossil fuel companies, warning very accurately about exactly what was going to happen. And for some decades, they studied it. And there's even these internal memos in ExxonMobil, um, actually part of lawsuits. Uh, so you can, you can see these online where the, their actual senior scientists are saying, we've got a serious existential problem for humanity unless we start doing things about it now. And that was being spoken about at Exxon. And they made the deliberate decision to basically lie to the, the human population. They made the decision to actually, they, they hired the same people who had been uh, paid for decades by the tobacco industry to come up with false reports, attack the scientists who were showing what was going on, obfuscate things, pretend that it needs more study and all this stuff and causing an untold millions of people to die from, uh, from nicotine poisoning, everything else. Um, all those decades, they used the same people to basically uh, keep this sense over the last few decades. Of, is there a problem, you know, giving ammunition to these climate denialists, all these things? I mean, these are people who, in my view, are um, guilty of some of the greatest crimes against humanity, crimes against the whole living earth that have ever been conducted in history. And they're walking around, not just free people, but actually, you yeah, know, respected executives and um, some of whom even had positions in Trump's uh, regime in Washington. So we have to be aware that these have deliberately, it's not like we knew about it, we didn't do anything. People knew about it and deliberately have tried to make more billions of dollars in profits at the expense of future generations and people living right now. Thanks, Jeremy. It's, I, I, you know, you're right. It's not we, it's, there, there's, there's a difference. Agreed. Um, Brenda, did you want to comment on that? I think he covered it beautifully. <laughs> so uh, I want to bring up uh, psychedelics again. Someone had a question. Uh, could meditation have the same effects as psychedelics and connectivity? Mm -hmm. Well, shall I, um... Um, speak to that uh, um, a little bit. Um, I think it's a really good question. And I think meditation, I, I'm actually a meditator myself. I meditate several, uh, essentially every day. Um, and uh, I think that it can be a very, very valuable and important tool to actually um, to deconstruct, again, these um, places of separation that our culture gives us and to get more connected with ourselves and connected with others. There are different types of meditation. There's particular meditations around compassion, where we actually learn to re reconnect with what is natural in our hearts to really connect with people in compassionate ways. Um, so I think that could be very valuable. And I don't think it's, we can really compare meditation and psychedelics other than the two actually tools together can be incredibly powerful. I mean, psychedelics without the kind of intentionality and conscious awareness that meditation can bring can lead people to go all kinds of weird directions that are not necessarily helpful at all. And with meditation, some of people get stuck. It's very easy to try to work hard into practice and it becomes hard work and it doesn't feel like you're going anywhere and you sort of know you should do it, but then it's, it's, it's not necessarily powerful enough to break through some of those barriers, which is why actually when you try to uh, hopefully use those two different tools together that can be actually super effective. Yeah, I, I'd like to, on a positive note, I'd like uh, uh, Brenda Davis to talk to us about what the Canadian Dietary Guidelines just recently did compared to the U.S. Dietary Guidelines. Uh, it's really, it really shows us that governments can make a difference and people are making progress. It just happens to be going on in Canada at a much more progressive rate than it is in the United States? Well, um, what John's talking about is, is uh, our new food guide. And uh, for many years, like the US, we had a food guide that was essentially 
um, you know, food groups that included uh, meat and meat alternates, uh, fruits and vegetables, uh, grains, uh, and uh, dairy products. And um, so ha half of the guide for many years was pretty much uh, animal dominated. And, uh, and what happened in this uh, latest rendition of, of Canada's food guide is uh, we now have a plate and half the plate is fruits and vegetables. Uh, and, um, and a quarter of the plate is uh, grains. And uh, the last quarter is, um, is, is uh, protein rich foods, which do include um, animal products, dairy and meat and whatever. But it's, all, it's quite filled with plant options like beans and tofu and nuts and seeds. And, and then there's a very strong recommendation to choose mainly plant protein sources. And so in essence, what you've got is you've got a guide that is 75% plants, and then the other 25% is some animal products, but with a great encouragement to choose predominantly plants, which you know, makes the guide, I would say, close to 90% plus. Uh, plant-based and and what's really unique about the guide is there's no longer a an essential dairy group uh, so dairy products have always um, had quite a prominent position in in North American whether it's American or Canadian food guides with their very own group and and uh, you know eventually we allowed some soy milk in as an alternative but for years it was just dairy and it was kind of, you know, each group was considered essential without which you will die kind of uh, attitude. And so for the government to remove that completely and, you know, put a little bit of yogurt in the, uh, in the, in the, in the protein uh, group is, is just huge. And, and so basically, essentially what happened is the Canadian government was very successful in keeping the industry out of the of, of the decision making in in developing the food guide, so whereas in the states there's a lot of um, a, a lot of input from industry, if you will, and and so with the Canadian food guide, they really wanted it to be evidence based, and I know my writing partner Vasanto Molina and I and a number of other people you know, we were able to have some, some input and, and uh, give comment. And, and we, we really strongly uh, suggested uh, to, um, you know, to Health Canada that, um, that it is in, in fact racist to include dairy as an essential group because dairy products, an estimated 68 to 70% of the world's population can't even tolerate this stuff, are, are lactose intolerant. And to have a guide that makes it essential uh, is forgetting about uh, this vast majority of human beings, uh, many of whom are citizens of this country who can't tolerate this stuff. So, um, so we were uh, absolutely over the moon with their decision to make this guide more inclusive, um, less industry influenced and more science based. So, and I think what we've essentially done is we've, we've got a guide that is an example for the world. Um, and uh, so I'm really proud of, of Health Canada for what they've done. And I can tell you, it's not without pushback <laughs> from industry. I can remember when I was, you know, first we wrote uh, the first book I wrote, I've, I've written 12 books now. And the very first one was called Becoming Vegetarian. And this was back and we started it in 1992. And, and it was, uh, it was a, a book that was kind of vegan in disguise. <laughs> So, because we figured the word vegan back then wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't go over so well. Uh, but we actually had a chapter called Without Meat. How do you survive without meat? How do you get the protein and iron and zinc? Then we had a chapter called Without Dairy. Well, the dairy industry thinking this is a vegetarian book, they figured, oh, it would be very dairy friendly. It would be dairy everything. And when they saw it, they actually um, wrote a 45 page rebuttal to our book and took a full page ad out in our professional journal 
to to criticize to actually call us irresponsible dietitians imagine registered dietitians saying you could survive without dairy it was just it was uh you know um blasphemy at the time and uh, and so we of course we wrote our 45 page rebuttal to their rebuttal and but for years the industry has had such a powerful voice in national nutrition recommendations. And I can remember back in 1990, the World Health Organization warning governments uh, about these alliances with industry and how they will negatively impact health. And it was a very powerful document. And, and we're, you know, we're slowly inching our way forward. Uh, and I hope I, it's unfortunate I, you know, that that the US isn't isn't uh, sort of galloping forward quite as quickly as Canada has, but I, I know it will come. I know it will uh, eventually. <laughs> Yeah, we, you know, things are changing. I think, you know, we said it this morning, when I was a little girl, um, hardly anybody did this. And now there's people all over that know about this lifestyle and are trying to make a difference. So things are changing. I know not as quickly as you'd like them to, Dad, and, and not as quickly as they need to. I mean, as you said, our environment, it doesn't have that. It doesn't have decades. You know, we need to make this change. And and, and events like this are really bringing awareness and bringing all of us together and, um, you know, letting people know that they're not alone and they're not crazy. And this is a real true message and, and facts that we need to face. So thank you both so much. Okay. Well, thank you. <laughs> yeah. So any, anything else that you want to bring up, Dad, Dr. McDougall, before we well. wrap up? I just, I just want you to know this has been a fun day for me, and you did a wonderful job, Heather, moderating things and keeping us all on track. And uh, this, uh, this type of seminar is, uh, is presented by the McDougall Research and Education Foundation. And, uh, you know, if you don't have any place to put all the extra money you're making on the stock market now because of climate change and, and because of COVID-19, you can always toss a little bit our way. We're going to be putting on many, many types of seminars, and definitely... We're going to be doing seminars on uh, diet and the climate. Uh, we're the only ones that I know of around the world that are doing this. And so, you know, we're going to take the lead until somebody else does. But the job has to be done. And we certainly appreciate all the speakers we have. I tell you, we didn't have a, we didn't have a, a weak link in the chain, Heather. I don't know how in the world we get so lucky to find uh, such wonderful people to contribute. And I bet it would be like our program, our, our living and our telemedicine programs. The nicest people in the world seem to join us in our efforts. Or maybe we just bring out the nicest uh, qualities in all of us, including the speakers. It was an amazing day. I can't thank you enough. Agreed. Yes. Thank you so much to everyone that attended. It was great. Please remember this entire event has been recorded and will be on our YouTube channel on Monday. So please watch it again, share it with your friends and family, and know that we will be doing these again. This has been so much fun. So uh, Brenda Davis, Jeremy Land, thank you so much for being with us today. And thank you all to our, 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 all of our other speakers that were with us today, and to Dr. McDougall, dad, for putting yeah. together. It was great. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful rest of your day or evening, and uh, we'll see you again soon. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank Bye.